Okay, so you guys are on the landing page? Looks like it. It's loading for me. There we go. I see a barrel and a very creepy looking dude. Oh, there's dead guy. That's not a creepy looking dude. That's an elephant. Yeah, it's got should... tentacles coming off its face. Uh, you guys should have some effects uh, going on I like on the there, mist right? effect and the, uh, yeah, man. There you go. All right. Right. Yeah, a little All bit, right. Know. A little something. Pretty so something. Fancy. Someone's <laughs> been putting work in. Okay, so uh, here's the deal. Uh, the name of the mega dungeon is going to be Stone Hell, um, and uh, it is a, uh, a pre-published dungeon by Michael Curtis, but I'm going to... It's going to be like the skeleton of basically like the entire campaign, but we're going to... We're going to work together to kind of meld it into something that's going to be completely unique. Um, so the first thing we're going to do here is actually kind of talk about, uh, we're going to go through the house rules document, which will sort of, oh, can people put um, headphones on? I'm hearing echo, if you've got them. Um, we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to go through the house rules document and we're going to talk at point by point about each one of the, the house rules, which will then kind of lead into discussion about the campaign in general. Um, but, uh, this will also outline how it's going to be very different than the Hole in the Oak uh, campaign, um, even though we're going to be using basically the same rule set. The, all the expectations of it are going to be completely different. And then we'll do character generation at the end, which doesn't take that long because OSC is pretty pretty simple, right? The longest thing that you're going to do, be doing and spending time on is buying equipment, which is the most important part of um, old school play, right? So um, I'm going to... Okay, if you go into the... Uh, what's it called? The journal, the open book icon in the upper right. I have shared a bunch of stuff with you guys. So this is pretty cool. I have a mod now that actually allows me to upload complete PDFs. So you, you do not have to have them in a separate window. So the main book that you guys are using is the player's tome. If you open that can up. I, can I just make a point that the first thing that comes up is the death and dismemberment rules? Yes, we'll get to that. I'm not, I'm not, I I'm did not notice very that. We'll, we'll get to that. Yeah, don't, don't jump, <laughs> just do me a favor and don't jump the gun. There's a lot of stuff I've shared, but um, just just stick with me because it's all going to kind of be revealed as we kind of talk about it. Um, so the Player's Tome is the main book. Uh, you can see that in the bookmarks that they are all... If you go to the table of contents in that book, um, first of all, you can marvel at how well organized this book is. It's absolutely fucking stunning um but if you go to the table of contents they are all hyperlinked so you can, oh shit yeah um so you can use the actual bookmarks from the pdf or you could use the hyperlinks in the actual table of contents and it's really really nice now this is actually a uh a product that has not yet been released it's going to be really it's it finished kickstarter but because i was a kickstarter backer i got the pdf early so this is the advanced player's tome so this is the one that has all of the old AD&D first edition stuff in it that's been sort of retrofitted into um, BX style play. Um, but a lot of this stuff, um, I'm incorporating it. A lot of it is off limits. So if you're taking a look at like the classes and races, don't get all happy about it because you're not going to be able to play the vast majority of those. All right. Like Acrobat or Nerf Nibbling? Well, yeah, we'll go through it. Um, so that, okay. this is the player's tome. I have the referee's tome. That has, uh, so if, you, if there are certain rules that you don't see here, like for dungeon exploration or something like that, but it's in my book monsters treasure that sort of thing it's in my book um but this is a uh, uh this is like the bible this is it right now if you want a uh, a real quick reference um the reference booklet is actually really really nice because it's got beautiful layout because it's necrotic gnome and um uh it basically has all the charts and uh procedures and stuff like that all kind of um cool labeled there so you can do that quickly so i suggest keeping one of those two like minimized up in the, your window somewhere at all times It'll be the easiest way to reference rules. Um, and then uh, house rules is what we're looking at now. So this will be the document that I made for you guys. So if you open that bad boy up. <laughs> that's, that's Gary Gygax right there, buddy. Uh, so. Who's that? Up. Gary Gygax. I'm not Who's lying. Gary Gygax? Shut up. Shut Get the fuck up. up. <laughs> Get, up. <laughs> Get a rope. He's, this is like a writer or something? Did he? Oh, he wrote, he wrote Game of Thrones, right? He did, yeah. You're such a shithead. <laughs> Language. I'm okay. sorry. You're so a fucking shithead. We're going to go through point by point, and uh, we'll discuss um, what's uh, what the rule is, sort of how it deviates from the norm from OSC, um, or expected D&D &D play, and then... Um, uh, 
just discuss like why I did it, right? Basically. Uh, sure. So, okay. John, this yeah. house rules document is totally empty. Totally empty. I know because I'm going to reveal it one at a time. Oh, you're doing this the cool way. All right. It's, cool way, yeah. it's like a fog of war, but it's a fog of rules. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I know how you guys are. I'm going to be talking about point one, and you guys have already like sussed out all like 13 of the other points and, yeah, and have yeah, issues yeah, with yeah. all of them. So you're all gonna, right, you're all gonna right, get it piecemealed right. out to you. All right, I can play along. I know you guys do well. Sport. All right, the, the first point. <laughs> <laughs> point one, <laughs> subsection A. This is the fun one. Uh, they're all they're all going to be really fun. Okay, so uh, ability oh score generation. God. Everyone loves this, right? So you have your choice. You can um, you can do it the cool way, or the shitty way. No, I'm just kidding. Either, either one, I'm totally happy with. Anytime you build a character, okay, you can choose this. Uh, you can roll 3d6 down the line, okay? The line, by the way, is strength, intelligence, wisdom, dex, con, charisma, the old way, okay? Um, you're going to go down the line, and you can then, at the end, switch any two scores. So that's a little bit different, okay? Um, uh, if your total bonuses are less than plus one, you can reroll everything. Okay? Plus one? <laughs> yeah. In other words, like if you have something that's really like if you have like a five or something like that, which gives you a minus two, but then you have like a higher score that gives oh, you a plus I get one. You. you know what I mean? Then you only have a you have a minus one total, so you could be able to reroll all your stats. Okay. All right. Um, or am could... I supposed to be seeing a rules now? I'm sorry to interrupt because I still don't see the rule. You don't. Does have anyone you else not see the rule? yet? Uh, nothing has changed on the house rules document. Anybody else? Do you not see it? No, I don't. I don't see, I don't see it either. All right. Oh yeah, I, I know what I did. I'm sorry. There you go. Okay. okay. Oh, cool. sorry. I, there we go. Yeah. There oh, you I'm go. You. Okay. Sorry. My bad. All right. So you right. So first one, you roll three days, three three to six down the line. You can switch any of the two scores, right? But they have to be one for one, right? Boom, boom. If your total bonuses are less than plus one, you can reroll everything. Okay. Or you can do this one, which is two d six plus six down the line switch any scores but you can't re-roll okay so that i also linked to probability probability curves of each one so that you can kind of see like what the most likely thing scenario is 2d6 plus 6 gives you a range of 8 to 18 so you can't get anything less than an 8 so the but you have a much higher chance of hitting um uh, i think you have like a two two percent chance of hitting an 18 i believe or something like that versus like a 0.43 chance with a 3d6 um, but you have a much coward, higher chance. Coward, of, roll three, sorry, go ahead. I think you have a much higher chance of doing a thirteen or something like that with two d six plus six. Mm. Now, right, but, but then you also have a higher chance of getting an eight. That's correct. Um, and also, oh no, you don't. No, you don't actually. Sorry, but you. All right. Anyway, go ahead. Well, you can't get anything lower than an eight. That's the real bonus, right? Right. You have right, a higher right. chance of getting higher scores. It's good. It's def definitely more favored towards you guys. But the way that I'm balancing is that I'm saying, um, is that if you have. You, you get no re-rolls. You can switch any two scores, but what you roll is what you roll. You know what I mean? No matter what. So you could add straight eights down the line. Yeah. And and be kind of like slightly hosed, but you stuck with it. Right. Right. But you have a okay. much, but you but you can't get anything less than an eight. And you could easily get something less than an eight with a 3d6. Okay. Exactly. Um, so, uh, but I gave you the probability curve so you guys can actually see mathematically what you might want to do. Now that is for any time that you make a character. Any time. Okay. All okay. Right. Next thing up. This one's going to be controversial. It's a very oh. short, sweet sentence, but I know it's going to cause some consternation. I'll just let that sit there for a Yay! second. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Humans I only. like this rule. Uh, so I'm definitely going to lean into the fact that... Um, uh, it, uh, if uh, playing the other races, I feel like is like uh, it basically makes them less special, and uh, they make them more human, uh, which is something that I didn't never really had. I, I with the general style of play like I like now, I don't really want to do that. So this way, um, you are you can only be human. So anytime that you encounter something else, it's always something a little bit more strange and otherworldly. I love it. Um, yes, and right since, up my alley. since the derivation of all of that basically comes from. Fellowship of the Ring, anyways, but which has been wildly misinterpreted in D and D as if that's the norm for an adventuring party. Where if you actually think about why the Fellowship had multiple races, it was because um, they were under dire circumstances. You know what I mean? Like you know, the whole point was that the elves and the dwarves never got along, right? Um, so uh, 
this way you can only play humans. Now, that you can play the breadth of humanity. In other words, if you want to play a dwarf, play a human that acts like a fucking dwarf. Make him short and stout and give him a beard and give him a Scottish accent and make him drink a lot. He's just fucking human. Same thing with elves, you know what I mean? You can make an elf, you can make an elf like human that acts just like an elf. It's just that he doesn't have the powers of an elf, right? So, well, um, how's, how's that playing out exactly, right? Because the elf class has access to magic. No, I'm saying right. that I'm saying it's all in the role playing. In terms of the tropes, oh no, no, sorry, I'm confused. Not not the culture or anything like that. I'm just saying like we always, you know how it always is in the play. It's like the dwarves, the, the rules of being a dwarf never really come out that much that make them sort of mm. dwarfy, right? It's all sort of like in in the funny accent and the weapons that they use and like the idea sure. of them and all that kind of stuff. Which the archetypes all... we're playing, yeah, 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 yeah. So you can right. do that by playing a human. But my question is, the the class of elf, the class of dwarf, is not allowed. You correct? cannot play it. That's right. Good. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah, cannot yeah. play. I'm following now. Yeah. 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 All right. You can still role player to your heart, your heart's content. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, humans only. Cool. There is a and not to be a dick about it, there's there's no wiggle room like that. It's just yeah. the way that the campaign's going to be. Yeah. All right. Next one. Following on from classes, you can probably guess what we're talking about here. Uh, allow classes all right so i am uh i was gonna have it much more limited but i decided like you know it's 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 you know i i looked at them carefully to see like what would be um relevant to the kind of campaign setting i'm kind of envisioning like the kind of themes of it you know um and then um just giving you a and then also kind of they're all very well designed classes, but they they do show like that A D and D sort of mentality um, where you start to get a lot of um, of uh, what do you call it uh, not the not um, niche uh, hedging right like where where other classes start to move in on other classes territory sort of thing. So I also look look for that, and I look for ones that had very clear archetypes and very clear rule sets that didn't step on other classes' toes, at least as far as I could tell just from reading. Um, so. Assassin, Barbarian, Bard, Cleric, Druid, Fighter, Illusionist, Mage, Magic, User, Thief, and Warden. So, um, uh, you guys know all of those, or at least have a general idea of what those are from other editions or old play. Um, the Mage, um, I have pointed out a number of times in the Discord chat, it's from a, um, it's from the issue of Carcass Crawler, which was a Kickstarter exclusive, so that has also been shared with you in the items. Um, if you, um, if you go into that Carcass Crawler magazine, uh, you can find Mage. That is like the Gandalf wizard type right it's the one that where oh, they, you don't get to choose yeah. spells you just have a certain subset of abilities that you can do that are very gandalf like but you can you yeah. um, um i just think it's like a super cool class that i've never really seen yes done yes. before so um i may change the name of it because i think it's a little too close to magic you kind of just confusing you know maybe call that the sorcerer or something but um and then uh a warden is i love it it's also in carcass crawler it's a spellless ranger which I always liked. I love spellless rangers. I don't like rangers with spells. So um, it is. I, I look. I, I put the ranger and the warden side by side to see like what he did to change it. And all he did was remove spell casting from rangers and then uh, lower the XP uh, amounts through level for wardens. Mm -hmm. So wardens go up faster than rangers, and the only thing they lose is spell casting. Everything else is exactly the same. Now that said, as you can see in my little sub notes there, that the druids and wardens. Um, uh, you have to be careful if you're going to choose to play them throughout the campaign um, because uh, the, uh, make no mistake the vast majority of the campaign unless you guys take it in a wildly different direction that I'm not expecting which is very possible will be in a dungeon um, and the, the abilities of druids and wardens specifically in this edition do not translate well to other to non-wilderness settings just straight up you know what I mean they don't there's been no thought given to balancing the classes uh, in a number of different environments like they do in, in modern games, right? So, just so no, no urban druid, no, no underdark druid or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. It, you just, in like okay. the warden can track, but um, you no, know, it's impossible for them to do that in, on stone and things like that, right? Um, so, it's just, uh, it could still be really fun players fun characters to lean into and play but just a lot of your mechanical abilities are just going to kind of be moot you know for much of the time so just just be aware if you decide to do that uh next thing down for classes is that um uh, retainers will be a uh, hopefully a major part of the game you will not survive long without them 
Um, so we're definitely going to lead into hirelings and retainers and all that kind of stuff, but they can only be the four basic classes. You will never get um, any of the crazy classes and you'll never get um, any demi-humans classes. Gotcha. Right? They're going to be humans and they're going to be clerics, fighters, magic users, and thieves. That's so we, we couldn't get like a court dwarf? No. No. It would just be I, a I short don't... human. Because because they're not, because they don't, basically you're going to find out like in the campaign setting that uh, those those races, they don't live in cities and towns. You know what I mean? There might, yeah, be, yeah, yeah. There might be the dwarf in town and he's just known as the dwarf. You know what I mean? And maybe maybe you know but they're basically like they're like hidden secret cultures that don't like to interact with men you know sort of thing they're much more fey okay. and uh you know reclusive um but we could hire a short goofy dude right exactly um yeah you could hire uh what's his name uh, warwick davis he always needs work Ooh. um Dang. so and the third one is is that uh clerics which obviously is going to be a major option for you guys um it's not a role-playing restriction. I know it looks like one, but I just want to make very clear that um, the most work I've done so far in building out the lore is on the church, the religion, um, because I want the clerics to have like a strong basis for, you know, like I don't want them to just be like, I, I worship a God and then I go to town. You know, like I want to, if you choose a cleric, I can give you like some really solid foundation. Um, uh, but so based upon the church that I've developed, if you are a cleric and not a priest or a member of, of, the typical church hierarchy you are you are a straight up zealot right you are um like as as i said like you kind of exhibit these traits that people would kind of call you out as being weird or touched or something like that uh because only very weird priests would go out and go adventuring and slay monsters and things like that so um it's Makes sense it would be something like where you would often you would have like War, warhammer 40k sort of like regalia you know what i mean like like just crazy shit dripping off of you and um, like you know, parchments and stuff like that, like yeah. just like you know, yeah, like, like huge fuck off weird looking weapons, you know, blunt the weapons. Thumb of a saint <laughs> nailed to a box on your head. No, but that's not across <laughs> the board. I, like I said, like you know, if I was playing a cleric, that's what I would do. You know, what I mean? but but there was very few of like the tonsured, um, brown robes, friar tuck sort of thing going on. That that would that's the that would be the 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 uh, exception to the rule rather than the normal adventuring priest who is like a fucking whack job. <laughs> but I can't. But I can't have a tonsure, correct? Uh, what's that? But I can't have a tonsure. You totally can have a tonsure. Right? Yes. Okay. yes. That's, <laughs> that's important. <laughs> As David lifts his pen off of his Cindy, correct? Yeah, <laughs> Wait a yeah. second. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, uh, so that's it for classes. Uh, let's see here. Next thing up. Sweet. Uh, starting hit points. Uh, let me just get this here. I tried to find a faster way to do this, but this is the best I can do, so suck it. All right, uh, starting <laughs> starting hit points. Um, okay. I'm going to be a little bit nice. First level, you get uh, you don't get max, but what you do get is you, you can't get lower than the average for your die roll. Which mm. for the starting classes is um, either D four, D six, or D eight. So that's three, four, or five, depending on your die, your hit die. So we do get to roll. You get to roll, but if you roll, okay. you know, less than that number, you get that number. Cool. Got it. Pretty straightforward. Yeah. Oh, and then uh, so... I didn't write this down, but subsequent uh, levels, it's you roll a one, you roll a one. Sorry. Uh, you really say sorry? Not really. He's I not will, really. Sorry. I will delight whenever you do not, when you roll a one. Believe me. <laughs> Uh, okay. Um, now, the three of you know about this one. David does not. David, you're probably going to like it a lot, I think. Um, but we want to hash, hash this out again. So this is a huge, huge change to the base rule set, but I think this is going to be awesome. Um, we are not going to do variable weapon damage. Okay? Uh, all weapons do the same damage, but that same damage, whatever that damage is, is based upon your class. Okay, so your class's hit die determines your base weapon damage. Fighters being the best, get a D8, clerics D6, magic and thieves D4, which is exactly equivalent to their hit dice, okay? Um, so that means that all classes, except for clerics, can use all weapons. Even magic users can use all weapons. But if a magic user uses a sword, like Gandalf or something like that, he uses it whenever he hits, um, he only does a D4 with that sword, fighter will do a d8 because he's more skilled in its use okay um so that's the way that 
that basically works. It's very simple. So whenever you're going to pull an item from the item list into your, if you pull a weapon into your inventory for your character, you're going to see that I've changed the weapons to say 1DN, and you need to go in and change that N to the correct hit die number, right? Okay. Okay. Simple enough. So, John, I would assume that a mage counts as a magic user. I believe so. It's whatever his, whatever, um, whatever his hit die says there. Probably, a probably. warden? Would a warden count as a fighter? It's whatever their hit die oh, is. Oh, it's their hit die. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Okay, so, but a mage is a hit die uh, D6. Okay, there you go. So cool. So that's, they count as a cleric in this. It's not a cleric. It just okay. counts as a six hit die character. That's what it counts yeah, as. Yeah, I follow you. Okay. All right. So, um,. In addition, we're going to do weapon mastery. Okay, so this is, but it's very simple. Um, your Thacko, if you look at your class charts, um, will increase or get better, I should say, um, at certain certain levels, right? And that's dependent upon your classes. So fighters and martial types go up much faster. Their Thacko goes, gets better um, sooner than, than clerics or magic users and thieves, right? So um, it is directly tied to increasing your base damage die, okay? according to like my little chart there, right? So when you're first level, when you're in that first bracket, like for fighters, I think is first to fourth level, you're going to do 1DN, where N is your class's hit die, right? When you get to the, your second bracket, which is sort of like mid-levels, it's going to go up one die. So if you're a fighter, it would go from a D8 to a D10. You're rolling D10s for damage, okay? Third bracket, right. which is like, using fighter as the example, I think it's around like 10th level or so, um, you would go to 2DN, so you would go back to a D8, but you roll 2D8. Got it? And then fourth bracket, which is the very highest levels, like 14th level, you would be going up to 3D, 3D8 or 3DN, right? You understand? Make sense? Okay. Um, and then, of course, the thing where everyone can use all weapons except for clerics, which can only use blunt weapons. Cool? All right. Makes sense. Uh... So I'm going to highlight a bunch of different weapon and armor stuff, um, some of which we went over without David that one night when we were just chilling. Um, I've finalized this stuff. Like, I've internalized a lot of the stuff that we talked about, right, um, and changed it. So, Okay. Uh, but David definitely needs to hear this stuff because it's very important, and I think David will like it. I, w I just want to show it off to David, really. <laughs> okay. Um, the... Okay, so uh, the weapons are going to be the reason. Th th so basically, the thing is, okay, so I'm a fighter. I get to roll d8s for weapons. Then why would I ever choose a two-handed sword over a long sword? Why would I choose, you know, or something like that? So we're, the way we're going to differ differentiate weapons and make it an important choice every single time, really honing in on making equipment, which really defines your character, is weapon traits. And I have developed a complete list of weapon traits. If you click on the on the name there, they will pop up. Um, and I have tried my best to make them all something that would be desirable to have given certain circumstances. So every time you're going to be going out, if you're, 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 you're sallying forth to go adventure, you have to think about what you're taking, right? And, and something is going to be left behind because of encumbrance, right? And so you're going to have to worry about, I wish I had that one weapon in this particular encounter, but shit, I forgot to bring it or I chose to not, I chose some, to bring something else, right? So um, these are the weapon traits. Now, a lot of these, um, all of these weapon traits basically have to do with uh, how they operate in combat, but you also have to take into account the balancing factors are their encumbrance, which is in the item's description, their cost, um, and also their utility outside of combat, right? The, the big example being axes, right, is the fact that um, if you only, if ever, if the entire party has a sword, then guess what? You don't get firewood, right? An axe can be used to chop down doors and break up wood and all that kind of good stuff. You're not right. So there's, um, there's a utility of that. Like a club and a mace, it looks on the surface that a club is vastly inferior to a mace because a mace has everything that a club has, plus it has uh, crushing. But a club you can pick up off the ground basically at any time. A mace you cannot, right? So these are the kind of things I'm talking about, right? So um, I have added the only weapon that I have added in addition to what is in OSE in order just to make the clearest choices a little bit better is the flail. Um, the flail is pretty fucking nasty. Um, uh, 
it's going to have the same thing that battle axe. this was actually ted talking uh from last time where he was saying that uh, battle axes were often used to um hook on top of an enemy shield and pull yank the shield down um flails were often used in the same manner in that they could be wrapped around a shield um basically negating the shield's um value so that uh, that has been translated into the forceful trait. This is like an example of these traits, right? So if you look at forceful, okay. the mechanical effect is that it negates an opponent's shield bonus to AC. So um, if you uh, if you attack with a battle axe or a flail, um, it's the assumption that in that attack you're basically yanking down the shield or getting around the shield with a flail, thus negating thus the person has um, uh, a higher AC or, or a, uh, a higher AC in this game means a, a, a worse AC. Right, so um, you definitely want to take a close look at those weapon traits. Uh, they are all um, detailed in every single item, every single weapon description. I've redone all the weapon descriptions so that if you go into a weapon, you'll see you'll see what the traits are, and they will be defined for you again within the weapons description. So it makes it easy to um, to look them up. Cool. Yeah, this is, this is really cool. All right, so uh, yeah, awesome. next thing for combat is that um, dual wielding, right? We want to have the option, right? So uh, basically it's this. If you have a strength or dexterity as your prime requisite for your class, you can dual wield. If you don't have strength or dexterity, you can't dual, dual wield. So if you're a magic user, you can't dual wield. You just can't. Sorry. Uh, but if you're a thief, I mean, if, yeah, if you're a thief or an assassin or a fighter or a warden, right, you can you can dual wield. So um, the typical D&D rules that uh, Matt, you know, you, you, know, you know from later editions too, uh, both weapons or the offhand weapon must have the light trait. Light trait is exactly what you've always known it to be throughout the years, right? Um, now, the difference is, is that in past editions of D&D, dual wielding was sort of like minus two for the first weapon and minus four for the second weapon. So fuck that. So what it's actually going to do is it's actually going to grant you advantage onto hit rolls. It's going to be easier to hit, but you don't get any extra damage. Okay? That's just, right? So you just roll one, one damage... Um, uh, and because both because your hit dice determines your damage, it's going to be the same same thing. You can determine any add-on effects from traits, depending you know depending on what's most useful at the time. Like if one weapon has a better, if you want to use forceful on one rather than the other, um, you can choose that. Right. Uh, so John, if you had a battle axe in one hand and a hand axe in the other, actually other way around, you could negate the shield advantage of your opponent. And then have advantage on the roll, striking for. But you got two different weapons; it's two different damage you dice. You could, although that example doesn't quite work because a battle axe is, has the two-handed property. So it does, old boy. Yeah. So it does. But, but I get Cheating your point. Yeah, quite so. But like, if it was a sword or something like that, then yes, you could. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But but like, well, it doesn't work. So yeah, never mind. All right, yeah. fine. We'll come to it when we come to it. So if you can be a half lane dual wielding. Uh, by handers is that okay is that, uh... <laughs> well no no halflings though that's right out <laughs> i'm kidding i'm kidding i already thought about just john you human, human with no angry. legs what's that that's john, right speaking of that though what's up with like the paladin and the knight what about the paladin? they're not in here they're, they're they not allowed access? no they're not allowed so the uh this is has to do more of the theme of the campaign um we want to be uh down on your luck adventurers right you have to you have to become heroes and I think that paladin and knights basically start as heroes. Um, so, yeah. Uh, my thought process too is like if you kind of want to play like a Roland sort of character, speaking of song of Roland that we were talking about, um, or a paladin play a type, um, play a cleric. Yep, exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and play that cleric as if he's he's an armored warrior instead of like a priest, you know. Um, but yeah, if you're looking forward to getting lay on hands, like it's, it, you can't graduate into the paladin class. Um, I thought briefly about doing some sort of prestige thing, but it was just too much design effort. I was like, "Fuck it." <laughs> so, paladins have always been second class clerics, anyway. Exactly. That's right. <laughs> um, okay, so um, now that is kind of leads into the armor discussion, right? Dual wielding. So the idea was is like you have to have a clear reason why you would choose to hold wield two weapons in one hand rather than having a weapon in a shield, right? Shields I've made much better in this edition, um, so there has to be a, a significant trade-off to give up the added protection of a shield and actually wield an extra weapon. And I think advantage to attack rolls is pretty pretty tasty. Like you would actually have to think like that's pretty sweet, right? Like maybe I do want that instead of a shield, because shields now, um, and this is thanks to you, Mike, uh, from last time. Uh, normally they grant a plus one to 
to AC, and now they're going to grant a plus two. Um, just I just think they're they're more you, they're, they're just good to have, right? So they're going to get you a plus two to AC if you use them. Obviously, that does not work if you're being attacked from the rear. Um, uh, but we're going to use the shield shall be splintered, uh, one of the most commonly used house rules for OSC, which basically says that you can choose to absorb the damage from a single blow, but then the shield is rendered utterly useless, right? Um, that is any blow, any successful hit against you, um, you can say, I, I use my shield and um, block it, but then the shield is destroyed and you can't use it anymore, okay? One time. Um, uh, so it's a basically a get out of jail free card that's a one time only. Cool. Now, uh, I also made helmets a thing. This is sort of one that I cut, made on my own. Um, so you can get a helmet. Uh, it does not provide any bonus to AC, but um, what it can do is it can absorb the damage from a single critical hit, right? Uh, so, uh, but then it is rendered useless, right? So it doesn't, it can't block everything, but if you, if I roll a natural 20, which is an automatic hit, it makes that a, a miss, okay? Um, but then it's rendered useless. It like t tears the helmet asunder, right? Um, if you wear a helmet, it imposes a minus one penalty to listen at doors and hear noise. Listen at doors is what everyone can do. Hear noise is, is the special thief one. Okay. Um, so a little bit of a penalty, but also a little bit of a bonus. All right. Next thing. I'm digging it, John. So far, so good. I so really far, like so it. good. If you have any questions, just stop me. I'm just running through them. But um, if there's any sort of re like, if you're like, why are we not doing this? Then just let me know. Or, or if you don't understand it. Um, okay, so next one is encumbrance. Encumbrance is extremely important, obviously. Um, we are definitely going to do it. I thought about doing um, basic encumbrance, but then I think it works better um, not only in the way that foundry sheets work, but also just in general for what I kind of want to focus on that we're going to use detailed encumbrance. So if you actually click that thing, it'll actually open up the PDF to the correct page. Um, this is what I do for you people. Very fancy. Uh, the the summary, though, is that um, all treasure, weapons, and armor uh, values are counted. And it, it's in, in coin weight, right? So in, all those weights you see are in coins, which is basically like if you divide the number by 10, that's the rough amount of pounds. Um, uh, your max carry, regardless of how strong you are, is 1,600 coins, period. That's that's where you top out. That's when you cannot move anymore is if you carry 1,600. Um, all adventuring gear, though, okay, like basically like regular equipment, but not armor and weapons, right? All adventuring gear, you can basically get whatever you want within reason, like what we can picture being on your body physically, um, is a flat 80, right? So you basically start like with your, when you build your character, um, and this is auto calculated in the foundry sheet, which is really, really cool. It's like once you start adding adventuring gear, it's not going to count any weight. It's just going to assume it's all 80, okay? Each or total? Total, total. So okay. your flint and tinder, your rope, your, your backpack, spikes, your torches, your, your rations, backpack. all that shit. Yeah, it's just okay. it just made a flat number, and don't forget too that it's not just straight pounds, it's not just straight weight, it's also bulk, um, and right. awkwardness. So, uh, so it starts at eighty basically, and then your weapons and armor will be counted separately, and then um, any treasure you you get like um, jewelry, gems, coins, things of that nature will also count against you. Mostly coins is what you're you have to really pay attention to. That's why weight is major measured in coins. Okay. Um, and that is all fully um, automated in the foundry sheet um, very very nicely, actually. I did a bunch of tests, so it's pretty cool. Cool. Um, next one is, uh, you should like this, I think, um, is that you're going to get access to the expanded adventuring gear list, which was actually included at the very back of the Carcass Crawler magazine. I have painstakingly added all of the additional items to our item list so that you don't, so that you can shop from... Um, the items tab rather than uh, and not having to add them individually you can just drag them into your sheet so um, uh, once again your equipment is basically what's going to define you so I know it seems like pretty mundane that like now there's a bell where there once wasn't a bell well if you can you know you buy a bell maybe you can think of really cool things to do with it right so um, it's it's just uh, it's hard to see how cool it is without actually comparing it to the original OSC list which but, but that was very limited and now the the carcass crawler adds in a whole bunch more that kind of makes it more in tune with like AD and D first edition. Like it's much more expanded. There's like a whole bunch of stuff that you can choose from fun toys to use. Cool. What uh, items tab are you referring to on the character sheet? No, um, in the upper right. So the little suitcase. 
you Piss, go in, baby. If you, go in, if you go in equipment and then adventuring gear. I've added you all just those. drag that onto your character sheet? I've added all those by hand, um, so you can drag them into your character sheet. And they all have little descriptions and stuff like that. Not diggity dog. Mm -hmm. um, okay, next one up. You're going to find a little something extra in your stocking this year, John. Thank you. A bell. <laughs> uh, It'll probably be a, some wolves bane. <laughs> uh, so for spellcasters, you're going to... I think you'll like this one. It's, a, it's definitely more in line with first edition, but it's a rule I always like. So... We're going to use the optional advanced spellbook rules for starting spells and adding spells. Click that link, you'll see what they are. Um, you'll recognize them for first edition. It's basically like um, your intelligence uh, does have is a factor where it wasn't a factor in the original rules. So um, the higher your intelligence is, the more <coughs> excuse me, the more starting spells you have, um, and the better higher chance you have of copying spells into your spellbook. Cool. Um, uh, I'm giving you read magic for free. That doesn't count towards any, um, you know, your starting limit or anything like that. You just get read magic is in your spell book no matter what. You have that for free. You still have to memorize it in order to read scrolls and shit like that. But um, uh, and uh, this one, uh, in the last thing, this is an important one. Your starting spells are going to be rolled randomly. Um, oh, be cool. Because yeah, this this will make you kind of have to think creatively as far as um, that you know first level you get one spell besides read magic and you're going to if you get ventriloquism well guess what get creative <laughs> you know but because if, if you were allowed to choose everyone's going to choose like charm person or sleep which are easily the best spells in for first edition right and that's no fun right it's no fun yeah. look at mike's face right now <laughs> yes. can i have <laughs> can i have David. that spell book i want that one in the picture oh, i want yeah, that spell right book. Which that's the book of ventriloquism, oh, yeah, that's, a, that's a sweet picture, yeah. Cool. That, oh, yeah, that only has a ventriloquism spell over and over. <laughs> uh, you can make the book talk. I haven't decided, like, like if you happen to roll Magic Missile, like, for your one spell, like, maybe I give you a reroll because it's it, it's such a bummer of a spell. To, I mean, it's, you know, it's cool. You get, you know, you could definitely damage something once, you know, but... Other than that, it's sort of like... Uh, it is pretty boring. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty boring. You know what I like about it, though? It seems like... Okay, so we're playing schlubs, right? Like, we're these are, like, low-level... Like, yeah. the bottom-of-the-barrel guys. The spellcaster version of that would would be a guy who found a spellbook. Oh, totally, yeah. It's so true. Right? <laughs> you know, I was not meant to so, have this shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so you get what, whatever you get, man. Yeah, yeah, totally. Absolutely. All right, uh, next up is a little bit more class-specific stuff here. Uh, this is a huge change. I have not quite finished translating it all into Foundry, um, and it's such a massive thing. I, I don't know if I have it in me, but I did some of it. Um, so uh, did a lot of thinking about this one. Uh, I think uh, it's going to be hard to kind of conceptualize it in your mind, like what it actually means until you actually see it in play. Um, but I think you guys are going to really like it. Um, Thieves and Assassins, basically the, the classes that have like the special skills, the percentile skills. You're not going to roll D100s. You're going to roll 2D6 and you're going to try to hit a target number. Okay? Um, like and, what? <laughs> well, you can see it in the charts. Uh, uh, so, but they basically match as close as possible to the percentiles, but because, they're, because there is no curve with a D100, right? There's an equal chance of hitting every single number. 2D6 versus a target number produces a really nice curve. Um, and so you're... you're you you don't you don't need to look at you like basically like if a thief has like a move silently of 10 percent, you look oh. at that and you're like well fuck that i'm never gonna fucking use that you know what i mean exactly um exactly. so this this way it, you have a much it i don't know how to i don't really know the math terms for it it's just like um it's 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 much it's not easier to do it's just more likely that you'll um that you'll want to try and give it a whirl yeah your your perception of it is 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 affecting in the way you'll play yeah which is i think really yeah. important and you're going to be more likely right. to hit the target number to hit certain numbers than you would if you were rolling percentiles right yeah so really well, you're, yeah. Only, you're only rolling basically a, um a percentile that goes up to 66 right is that is that what you're talking about a percentile that goes up to no, no he's saying that um let's say you're a first level thief and you want to move silently the target number is 10 or higher on 2d6 you're going to roll 2d6 and add your dex bonus that's a that dex bonus actually does something for you on a two d six in a way that it totally would not. On That's a correct. D1 yeah, it allows right. you to use a dex bonus. Now the dex bonus is not the 
missile bonus. It's the initiative bonus, which is actually a little bit. Uh, oh sure. I don't want to go out to plus two, but um, I'm, so still... I'm sorry. I'm so confused. Hold on. So, so, so here, start... my my target number is ten, right? Yeah, okay, so right. I'm playing a thief. My target number is ten. I roll nope. a TD two d six. I get a three and a four, mm -hmm. and my dex bonus is plus two. So, so you're at a nine. Mean? You missed right? it. You missed it by one. Yeah. But if you rolled a four and a four, you'd have made it. Yep. So you want to hit that target number and higher. Yep. So yes. what if you're trying to what if you're trying to climb a sheer surface and your chance is eighty seven? So on this chart, just climb the, walls is five or higher. You see, well, hold on a second, Mike. Do you see the chart? Did you hit the blog post? I have too many windows open at this point. I'm looking at the. <laughs> I'm I'm looking at the character build, like the actual like acrobat stats. No, Don't no, look no, at no, that. No, no, look I, at the not, block. This post. is my house rule. This is my house rule. It's not in the official stuff. I know, but I, like I've lost it. It's somewhere in here. <laughs> I'm looking. <laughs> I've got like 18 well, our windows first, open our at first this point. Technical difficulty of the night is Mike's computer literacy. <laughs> okay, uh, actually, for, forget the blog post. Every everyone walk through these stats with me. Okay, this is really easy. Okay. Yes. Just yeah, stay yeah. in Foundry. All, right. All you All need right. is Foundry. Okay. Uh, go into the uh, briefcase. Yeah. Briefcase. Okay. Go into yeah. classes. Go into Good abilities class. thief. Find I'm in there. Find um, climb shear surfaces. I'm on it. Okay. Now I have changed these charts. This is what this is the actual chart that we're going to be using. Okay. So where at level one before there was an 87% chance of climbing shear surfaces. Now you need to roll a five or higher on 2d6, which maps somewhere around like 80, 85% or something like that um, to be able to do that. Okay. In addition, you get to- I got it. So instead of, instead of an ascending percentile of chances, it's a descending thing from 10. That's right. The, the target got... number gets lower, which makes it okay. easier to hit that number. Got it. Understand? Also, yep. seeing two dice psychologically is a lot more encouraging than looking at a D100 and seeing a small figure. For the right. Success. Very true. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, if you a want, player who, yeah, go ahead. The, the the rule was written by Dyson Logos. He's like really, really well respected, both as like an uh, artist and map maker, and also a designer in OSC. Uh, so feel free to read the blog post and see like his theory behind it. But it convinced me, and I think sure. it's really, really cool. Um, sure. So, uh, so you get you add your dex bonus to initiative to the obvious roles that dex would affect, and then for find and remove treasure traps, it's your int bonus. So that's you know it's an int sort of thing. Okay, that makes sense. Um, now the hear noise has stayed as basically a um, a single d6 roll, which it always was. Uh, just because we want to keep it something where you either do or you do not hear, you like there's still a 50 50 percent chance. Sure. Um, so that stays the same. But it's all it's all been automated in each into what each individual thief ability here in Foundry. Um, so you don't really have to think about it, but you can reference these to sort of see what target number you're trying to hit. But if you just hit the roll button, it'll automatically roll it and tell you if you hit the number or not, success or fail. Got cool. it. I all like right. it. I like that. Um, uh, all right, and then we're going to go into what you've all been waiting for, death and dying. No. Because you just know what's going to pop I'm up. sure we'll be using this rule a lot. Some of us will. All right. So instead of what we were doing in OSC, right, you drop to zero, you're dead, right? That happened a lot when we were doing a Hole in the Oak. When you, but th this, it's it's even worse. It's even worse. You're gonna drop to zero. <laughs> What's worse than that? <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna drop to zero hit points. But um, when you your do, buddies all piss on you. When you drop to zero hit points, you have to roll on the death and dismemberment table. Uh, so now you can kind of click that. Uh, you can click that link and check this out. Um, this rule system is so dope. Uh, the second page is trauma insanity, which is not relevant to this. So it's only the first page that you're looking at. Um, so All right. first thing before you read it, this is the uh, uh, actually this his first sentence sort of explains how I want to kind of deal with um, abstract combat, right? So basically, hit point loss until you reach zero hit points um, has not broken your skin, right? There are you have no visible wounds on you until you've actually hit zero. All right, but when you hit zero, that's when the real nasty shit starts happening. So as your hit points are whittled down through combat, that is like fatigue 
getting banged around, um, positioning, right, sweating, and all that kind of stuff, um, and uh, just wearing you yeah, down. A, and then, the metaphor. Yeah. yeah, and then when you hit zero, you and you want to think about this stuff as we're kind of doing descriptions in combat as well. You know, when you hit zero, or they're grazing wounds, like for instance, like an arrow, obviously is not going to fatigue you. You're going to get hit by an arrow, right? <laughs> but, um, but. Uh, uh, and when you hit zero is when you take the real nasty wounds. Okay, so first of all, you're going to roll a hit location, right? Pretty straight up. Um, it might be, and then there's also uh, columns for specific types of like magic damage, like acid, fire, eldritch, lightning, sort of things like that, right? Um, uh, and then you're going to roll the severity. Okay, so it's a, it's on a d12 plus the amount of lethal damage, basically, which is like the amount of damage from zero into the negatives that you took. So if you were at two hit points and you took five hit points of damage, the lethal damage would be three, right? And then you're also gonna add the number of current injuries that you already have. Like if you've already had to roll on this chart before, you would add that number as well. But let's say like it's your first time going down below zero and you, uh, you took three points of damage into the negatives. So you would roll 1d12 plus three. Um, we'd say we rolled a leg, right? Uh, and we roll a seven, right? So we rolled a 10 total. So you would be disabled for your severity number of days, right? So your severity was 10. So you'd be disabled for 10 days. And then you go down to the um, disabled thing. One of your limbs becomes unusable, cannot hold things. Uh, disabled leg cannot support your weight and you fall prone. Afterwards, your movement is cut in half, right? So shit is brutal, but it's so good because it's like has abs it has total mechanical effects. It, they're directly related to dungeon crawling, <laughs> and um, the 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 really nasty one is the is the fatal wounds, right? So if you take a fatal wound, and this is really cool because it has a bunch of little subsystems in here. Um, uh, uh, you have three rounds to get rid of them all, or you die. Uh, so you can attempt yourself to kind of get yourself out of that uh, by kind of healing yourself by rolling a one on a D6. So that's like a 16% chance, um, right? 16, I think. Um, uh, and then an adjacent ally so it can do like the whole uh, binding wound sort of thing. But I love this sort of, uh, this sort of uh, thing. So instead of like a medicine check or whatever from modern editions, um, uh, you're gonna try to roll under half your intelligence score. So you're gonna roll an intelligence ability check but starting at half your intelligence score. So if you have like an intelligence of 10 and um, you have to roll under a five on a D20 and then you would heal your buddy of one fatal wound. Cool. Mm -hmm. Thanks. It's actually not that dissimilar than Warhammer. No, it's, yeah, it's very, very Warhammer. I mean, obviously the, the, the brutality of it is, you know, um, there's still a lot of room for- Well, just the, fact, just the fact that you don't really have any negative effects until you lose your hit points and yeah. then things get negative really quick. Right. Yeah. Right, but that's the same like D and D's like in in modern editions, it's in Pathfinder stuff like that. You don't have any bad effects until you hit zero either, right? You keep going strong, and then you then you die. Um, right. But at least this way, it's like uh, there's like really interesting things, and there's nasty. So so this really makes you really not want to hit, get below zero because you might not lose your character, but you could lose a permanent point of strength, right? And guess what? In this edition, there's no ability score raises. You don't just get to raise your ability score. You better hope you find like the manual of puissant skill at arms, or you're fucked. You know, you know what I mean? So you don't. You, your your ability scores can easily go down. They very very rarely go up. Um, you can lose your eye, right? <laughs> just go into a coma. Spine broken. Uh, if you're burned, you can't wear armor. I love that. It's so cool. That's awesome, actually. Yeah. Where's the link to the retirement plan and the, uh, the healthcare system? <laughs> right. Yeah. Totally. Uh, so, um, so worst comes to worst, um, you take a number of fatal wounds that you can't recover from. Right. You have basically the worst comes to worst is you have a fatal wound, and then you have three rounds in which to 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 not die. Right. So um, you always have a cushion of three rounds no matter what. But then there's all these other tacked on things that you may suffer from as well. Um, but even uh, even healing from the fatal wound is is pretty slim chance, right? Now, what what happens if you're fatally wounded and then something attacks you again? Uh, you would get another you... fatal wound, I believe. I would have to... Does it start at zero or does it start going off of the previous? It starts going off the previous. You, the fatal wounds are cumulative. 
Um, but yeah, so pretty nasty. Uh, and the last one, this one's really good. This one, getting away from the morbid stuff, this is the fun shit. If you want to gain some extra XP, you get to carouse in settlements. Cool. So if you hit the carouse link, you're gonna like this one too. My favorite picture that I put up. <laughs> 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 so uh, once per session, when you are in a civilized settlement, that is the key, right? Um, you can choose to carouse in order to gain extra experience points. This is on top of the XP you get for returning gold and treasure back to a settlement, which is how you get XP in this game. On top of that. If you choose to carouse and spend that money by carousing specifically, not not investing it, not buying new armor or new horses or something like that. If you choose to to uh, indiscriminately, unwisely spend your hard-earned cash, um, you can gain extra experience points on top of what you already have. Um, so you can choose uh, which role you want to make, but it is limited by the settlement size. So. The larger the settlement, the more choices you have of, of how much you want to spend. It's just basically like certain settlements can't handle cash flow, you know, cash expenditures, of, you know, past a certain size. Um, just, you know, certain settlements below a certain size, you can't find that, you know, longing looking cheap that you want to love up. Yes, ex bit. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah. You so, can't go to uh, that Tijuana donkey show at a homelet. <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> so let's assume like you, you know, early levels, you're only going to be hitting like a village, right? So, um, you can actually go into the, this actual document that you're looking at right now. Um, and you would click the 1d6 times 100 and you would, uh, you would spend that amount of gold pieces and you would gain that amount of much of XP, right? What do we got there? Who was that? Matt? Okay. Yeah. So you spent 500 gold pieces. Now here's the thing. If you, it was your choice to spend that you're saying i'm going to go carousing and i'm going to do this shit and i'm going to do it at the village level and then you know like, my leg just got chopped off <laughs> the people are like, everyone's going to buy me drinks um but you spent 500 gold pieces okay that money is spent no matter what but you look at your character sheet and you're like fuck i've only got 350 gold pieces um well guess what that, <laughs> that money was still spent it means that you owe somebody and that person that you owe is not going to be a very pleasant person um, so uh, you're gonna like owe it to some organized crime or nefarious figure or something like that. Um, in addition, your your uh, allies, your fellow PCs, um, they can uh, choose to pay the different. You know, they can help you out to pay off that debt if you want. Um, uh, but the money is spent, but you also gain that much XP. Um, now, if if the money that you spent is more than what you have on hand. Um, uh, you have to roll on the carousing mishaps table, which is also very fun. Um, don't, don't click, just do me a favor and don't click on it right now because it's, you know, you're going to, you're going to see all the different options and it's just going to spoil the fun. Um, but okay, there's, okay, okay. there's a lot of, there's a lot of fun stuff. Um, the other, Everyone the other, already read it, but me, the, the, the other, the, yeah, don't click on the big red button, please. Uh, the, the other <laughs> thing that's going to cause a, uh, a triggering of the mishaps table is that um, if the die result, not the total result, like Matt rolled a five, right on the d6, if the if that is higher than your level, you have to roll on the carousing mishaps table. Okay. So if you go carousing at first level, very likely you're, you're on a very high it. risk. You're gonna fuck it up. That's right. Yep. But but that's what's kind of cool is like it's a risk versus. I love it because it's like a risk versus reward sort of thing. It's like do I, I want the extra XP? You know what I mean? That's like super juicy, especially 500 XP at first level is super fucking juicy, right? That's like really especially nice. If you're only like 400 XP away from leveling. Yeah, totally. When you, when you get yeah. back to town. Yep. And who do you um, think in this group is going to take the most risks? <laughs> <laughs> really, Mike? <laughs> but you can see I as you, it. as you, as you go higher in level, you can, um, you can gain access to larger rewards. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, as you gain access to, to more populated centers, you can gain access to higher rewards, um, ability to spend more money, which you'll probably have access to as you get higher in level. Um, but you also have the choice to mitigate some of your risk by not carousing quite as hard. You get to choose how hard you want to party, basically. That's how it goes. 
right? Um, but that that choice expands in the the larger the settlement that you are in. So, um, and the other cool thing here, at last, is that um, thieves. If you are a thief or an assassin, and you have actually role played your way or gotten to enough a higher level where you are actually part of an organized crime element in that settlement, you get a plus two on the roll, straight up. And then all of your fellow members who take advantage of that of, of, as well gain a plus one. Okay, that's basically like you have you have access to the sweet lotus root before anyone else does. But we know Louis, right? Um, and so that is all I have for house rules. Um, that does not mean that other ones won't be incorporated as we play, or that things may be changed, existing ones may be changed or discarded, um, because like I said, this is all just from me reading stuff. Um, a lot of them I made up, uh, but. Um, uh, you know, I've done a lot of research on them, so I, I, I feel pretty confident about them, and I definitely think they're worth at least giving them a try. But that said, I wanted to get that all out of the way because that is going, definitely going to change. Like, the, the weapon damage thing um, based on classic dice is going to be a huge factor, and um, it's going to change a lot, of, a lot of things, right? It's going to be think, very different. All weapons are going to look very different than what you're used to. You have to be very careful about looking at the traits. They actually mean something versus Pathfinder 2E, where... We, we quickly forgot about the traits that they had unless they were restrictive. Um, uh, and then um, encumbrance is also very important. Um, an understanding about what, what hit points means and what it means when you hit zero. Um, that sort of stuff uh, is going to affect, I think, your choices and how you choose, you know, choose what to play and what to build. Right? Um, so, overall, uh, for the campaign in general, um, we are... Um, we're talking about a campaign that I, I I deliberately haven't invested as much world building into as I have done in the past. Um, I want this something to sort of be like a little bit emergent, right? So, like I said, I've built I have a general idea, very general about like the overall geography, about um, recent history, basically. Um, uh, and uh, the most detail I've done is actually on the Peleetic Church, which is the um, the religion. Uh, there's basically only the one that's uh, uh, a monotheistic religion um, that has um, heavy Catholic. It's got a lot, like a, a lot of heavy, like uh, the major monotheistic religion overtones, just so that they can be easy touchstones upon which to um, role play off of. You know what I mean? So you don't have to really, really stretch and try to imagine weird pantheistic stuff. Um, but there's a lot of uh, saint worship as well. So there is like uh, oftentimes a priest will be favored towards one saint uh, that kind of takes the place of like a pantheistic sort of um, idea um but and Mart martin luther hasn't nailed anything to the church doors yet. no but there is there is a lot of um i don't i don't have it fully detailed but i have the notion that there is a lot of heresies and things like that as well so you can easily play some and if you want to play like a cleric who's sort of like a pariah from the church that's totally doable we can work on that together um but uh i'm not going to be i don't think it's going to be like one of those things where uh where i'm going to directly ask for you to give me lore um but i just think that it'll kind of emerge through play as we kind of just discuss things but i'm not going to ask you like a discreet question and, and be like i don't know what the what the church hierarchy is you tell me you know that i'm not going to do that you know um but uh what, what i really want to do and it's going to be very new to me too because as we were talking about when we were just chilling that one night when we played old school, the ones of us who have played old school, we were very young kids, so we weren't playing old school the way that old schoolers play old school, right? Um, but I'm gonna, so it's it's very new to me, even though the rules are familiar, um, the gameplay style it's gonna be learning for me as well. But I definitely want to try to lean into it as much as possible, and um, that primarily involves for the campaign, where uh, I am not setting up a plot, I'm setting up a situation, right? I'm giving like here is here are the parameters. Here is the closed matrix in which you are going to be um, acting in. Um, there is a problem. Figure it out, right? And then you go from there, and then the stories will sort of emerge as we encounter things and move through and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it uh, so it demands you to be proactive. Um, and I know that sometimes we like a little push from the GM as far as, like, just get us back on track. And I'm willing to do that, but you're not going to find it in... Um, uh, overarching plot threads. It's going to be, um, it's just going to be more like outlying. Like here are the problems that you are facing right now. How do you want to deal with them? Like maybe if you've lost that kind of thread a little bit, that's that's more what it's going to be like. I'm also going to try very hard on my end 
to um, uh, prep only for the next session. I'm going to base everything just based upon, you know, so that it's it's completely dependent on you to determine where mm -hmm. which direction the campaign, the, compl the plot is unfolding so that I do not, because I find like whenever I do um, a lot of heavy planning that I will unconsciously try to steer you along that because I did so much planning. Sure, sure, sure. 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 Um, yeah. So it'll be in order to prevent that and to i think it'd be a better, better time for you guys is is um i'm only going to have in my head just what i think you might do for the very next session and then that that's it <laughs> you know um, sure. and then you're going to act through that session and I'll, I'll readjust for the next one you know that, that's my attempt that's what i'm going to try to do we'll see if it actually works but um so uh i was just talking to ted before you guys all jumped on uh basic uh technological level uh cultural uh realm is uh we're talking like uh, 1350 to 1450 europe um nothing too out of the ordinary as far as the typical D, &D fantasy stuff um the i've already told you about um humans only um so that means that all other species all sense all other sentient species um will probably fall line follow fall along the lines that you're pretty much used to in your standard fantasy um, but it's just that they're much more reclusive in general. So there's there's all the human races. They're all still there. Gnolls, trolls, goblins, orcs, all that kind of stuff. But also the demi-humans, dwarves and elves and halflings and stuff like that. But they are all um, uh, they are all either antagonistic towards humans or, re in the demi-humans' cases, um, uh, reclusive. Like they don't really want to have anything to do with them. Um, uh, I'm working... I'm kind of thinking... I don't really haven't work, really work, worked out quite yet, like how fey I want to make some of these races, especially like goblins and elves and things like that. But uh, we'll work it out as we as we kind of go through it. Um, now, the central idea of the campaign versus the actual world um, is one I'm pretty excited about. And this was like the germ of what I wanted to do for the campaign is that, yes, it's a mega dungeon. And I want to lead into all the tropes of the mega dungeon, and all that kind of stuff and as an environment in which to play. Uh, a full campaign versus just a place to visit um, is that I'm going to turn it on its head a little bit. And um, the typical trope is the keep on the borderlands, right? You, you enter into the mega dungeon, you get some treasure, you try to make your way back out and you go to a place of rest and Haven in order to then uh, spend the XP or spend the loot or, or bring the loot back to safety and then get XP resupply, go back in rinse and repeat pretty enjoyable cycle. Um, We've all done it a thousand times. Um, I'm going to change it up a little bit. And uh, there's a reason why this is called Stonehell, the last refuge, is that you're going to find out through reasons in the first session that um, your ability to retreat to a safe haven um, is basically going to be uh, nullified straight out the gate. It's going to be very difficult for you, um, almost impossible for you because of uh, a massive uh, historical event a catastrophe to, to actually get back out of the dungeon. So one of your very first things that you're going, that one of the very first impetuses, one of the very first things that's going to want you, going to make you want to explore and to delve deeper, despite the dangers, is that you need to find a safe haven somewhere down there because there ain't one outside. Right? If you can't find a safe haven, you don't get XP. Right? You're just carrying a bunch of loot around. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so um, there, there will be careful, um, as there is in a lot of old school play, uh, careful time management. That will be the pressure cooker um, at all times um, and fear of the unknown, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so there will be a constant sort of hopefully a, a looming dread and a pressure to, to uh, go further. We can find it. We can do it. You know, we're almost dead, but we can make it, you know, sort of thing. Um, and uh, just to clarify, too, there won't be the... You don't want to term it um, as a high death game, right? It's more like um, it's a uh, it's a low combat game, I guess is the way to kind of put it, right? Because death is so um, uh, easy, it's going to make you think twice about going into combat, right? Um, if you if you want to make it a high death game, if you want to make it a high death game where things are where you're dying all the time. That's Go that's into basically as much as possible. That's that's correct. Yes. Yeah. Every time you yeah. see a monster. Now, there's a lot of that, that's we're, Hold on. We're getting, of, we're getting a lot of ambient noise from David. I don't know if you got a fan on or something, David. It's not from me. That actually might be me. Give me one second. It is not. Me. Yeah, um, it was John. 
Your little green box was lit the whole time he was talking, sorry. Oh, no, no, you're fine. I think my box is just always lit because my mic is <laughs> so close to my face. I'm going to talk real slow and quiet. Oh, yeah. Let me tell you, this cowboy is not going to fight once in this campaign. You better get ready for <laughs> it. I'm going to get the gold. And I'm How is that going to be through. any different? How is that going to be any different from any other game we've ever played? It won't, and you know, you, you know who's going to be, you know who's going to be dragging your corpse out of the dungeon like every other campaign. This guy, yeah, the, this, the guy that won't fight. This cowboy. The guy the back. <laughs> That's not skill. <laughs> it's not anything to be proud of. I think, I think what John is saying is the skill in this game is not in combat, but in evaluating the risk. Hey, John. I'm trolling Mike. You back? <laughs> Is that better? The noise? Yeah, it's much better. Yeah. Cool. Much better. Yeah, we, we got like a nice B-side while you were gone. Oh, yeah? <laughs> got all your frustrations out about how shitty this campaign's going to be? Oh, just the worst. <laughs> what I don't understand is why you won't let me write a 13-page backstory. <laughs> <laughs> um, so for the combat thing, um, uh, obviously it's going to be obviously mostly your decision, right, as far as to how much combat you want to enter into. But when there is something where you, you know, um, Wandering Monster comes down the hall, for instance, um, uh, surprise rolls are made and uh, whatever, the encounter starts... Uh, uh, a mitigating factor, a, a, a huge one that will be in play almost every single um, encounter is morale, right? Sure. Uh, I'm going to, uh, I keep, for, I, I for forgetting to do it in, in the hole in the oak and um, it's such a core part of the experience um, sure, sure, and it's sure. such a, a plus for for um, parties, um, survival chances. Um, uh, so that, that will be rolled, you know, that will be constantly be rolled. Um, encounter reaction tables will be used right not everything you encounter is automatically going to be hostile um it, again once again it's highly dependent upon um how you role play your initial contact with the creature um and also might be dependent on your charisma right uh, of any individual characters there is actual a bonus to encounter reactions if you have a high charisma um and of course uh don't forget too that charisma is the god stat in ose it is it's the decks of uh of of uh, BX, where uh, you know, instead of 5e, uh, because uh, it determines how many maximum retainers you can have. Right, another huge mitigating factor in your ability to survive is is throwing other bodies at things. Shadow. <laughs> <laughs> <Right. laughs> this is my role play, baby. Yeah. This is my... so. What Mike, what Mike doesn't realize is he was my retainer all along. <laughs> 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 wow. Um, I thought I didn't want to go into combat because I was afraid what he didn't know now, was he was my what, what I have is I, I am going to follow the rules in the in the book about um, who's available right um, Ted I'm sorry John I'm just <laughs> it's so true <laughs> and just expand into a place that never oh uh, you know it's true baby oh. <laughs> Just laid out. I just Ooh. laid out four years of us gaming together on the. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what was I, what was Sorry, I talking go about, ahead, John? I derailed us a bit. <laughs> I lost my train of thought. What was I talking about? Uh, oh, retainers, retainers, charisma. Yeah, retainers. So I'm going to follow the rules that are outlined uh, outlined in the book as far as like their avail availability and everything like that. I have a generator, a really cool generator that generates them. Um, but once again, realize that they can only be humans. They can only be the four basic classes. Um, and uh, the big the big rule that you guys want to remember, once again, the risk versus reward is like it's not an unending. Even, yeah, sure, you might have a high charisma and you could you could have eight uh, henchmen, uh, eight retainers with you, uh, but uh, every single one is another person that where XP gets divided amongst. Right now, the the good thing is is that um, in this edition that X that um, retainers take fifty percent of a cut. They take fifty percent of the share basically, so they don't they don't get a full share of XP. Um, but, uh, and they cost money, of course, you still, still got to pay their wage as well. Um, so, but they are also providing, you know, they're putting their life on the line. Um, and we're going to be ro rolling loyalty ratings and all that kind of good stuff as well to see if they're actually stick around and, um, that'll be affected by charisma, how much you pay them, you know, all the other good stuff. So, 
Uh, oh, and this is a big one too. Uh, I do not have the brain space nor the willpower to run retainers. So if you have retainers, they are yours too. And, and I think that falls in line too with the fact that you, that your individual charisma determines how many you can have. It's not the party's retainers; they're your retainers, right? So um, you'll get you'll get access. You know, once I build the character out in Foundry, you'll gain access to their sheets and everything like that, and you'll be responsible for running them uh, in combat. Cool. Perfect. Cool. Yes. All right. Cool. So uh, we have an hour, uh, which is pretty good, I think, for building characters. So if you go into the actor tab, um, you'll see PCs go into there. Um, you guys should all have individual access to your individual sheets. You can uh, same as Pathfinder. You 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 own your sheet, but every, other people can look at each other's sheets. Um, now, uh, this time around, we want to very carefully look at the functionality of these sheets. We were just sort of using them as reference in the um, Hole in the Oak game, which is more, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> just, a, just a fun thing I... to do quick. Um, so, uh, you, okay, so, well, you know what? Let's not go through the sheet right yet. Let's build, let's build the characters. Let's do the most fun part of D&D period, which is rolling for stats, huh? <laughs> Oh, yeah. I agree so much. Okay, so um, let's do it in an orderly fashion, please. Let's just go the top down from... Um, actually, let's do it from the OBS layout here. So we'll go around the horn, starting on the upper left with Matt. Um, so, Matt, your first choice for your character. Now, remember here is that you all of you want to approach character building as not what I want to play... But what can I play based upon what I rolled? <laughs> what my, st my stats get? So keep your mind blank, blank everything it's, out, and just think. It's only, remarkably easy. Think only I of sixes. So think much. only of sixes. I love oh, did you guys this fucking? So did you guys see that goddamn video I posted of that guy rolling those, that eight? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh my god! I every time I think about that. Anyways, um. All right, so Matt, do you want to roll 3d6 down the line with the ability to re-roll if you have less than a total of plus one bonus, or do you want to roll 2d6 plus six and guarantee yourself a minimum eight but not be able to re-roll? Oh, which one? You the second one, the no, re the no re-roll sounds ballsier, right? I want to do the one that's ballsier. That one sounds... Yes, yes. Jumping in, no yes. re-roll. <laughs> so you're going to do right? 2d6 plus six? That's an interesting definition of which one's ballsier because there's, yeah. You could get because you can't re-roll, but you could, but it's also like the medi the Good. medium, more medium one. Good. So then my plan is working. It's a hard choice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll I'll do two d six plus six. Right what on. What the hell? I love it. Okay, so uh, you're gonna roll. You're gonna go down the line. So um, you're gonna open up your character sheet. Got it. Let's look all look at Matt. Um. And you can see that they are they are labeled in a different order than 5e, right, Matt? So it's Strength, Int, Wiz, Dex, Con, Charisma. So that's the order you're going to do it in. So um, just roll those dice however you feel you can. Make sure is you're there, rolling it publicly. Is there a button to, a button to press, or do I just do it? You, you have to, yeah, unfortunately for that method, you have to do it uh, individually. So. Uh, I mean, make sure the roll is public. 2d6. 6. Okay, here we go. Okay. Sweet. Nice. Um, all right, all right. So we got okay. a right out the gate. straight 16 for straight strength. 16, pop that guy in. Holy shit. <laughs> well. <laughs> all right. So, Wizard. yeah, thief. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in. Six. I would not be disappointed if we all rolled really identical stats and basically I had to play an all-fighter team. <laughs> <laughs> that would be really exciting for me. <laughs> oh! Holy oh, shit! Holy oh, shit! Oh. We, well, we, we, we know who the leader is. <laughs> He's smart nice. and strong. We're, we're rolling straight down, right? He's like that guy Roll from Order, down. Order of the Stick. Remember the fight no, of Order of the Stick? This, this fucking guy. Seriously? <laughs> Yeah, I didn't realize. <laughs> Keep going. I'm gonna roll nothing at once now. The rest of us will all Let's be roll through it. No, no, okay, it's a little more oh, reasonable. Yeah. There's, uh... The party is bummed. Okay, we're all dying. Yeah. Six, but that's a twelve. Here's okay. the thing, though. 
Here's the thing, though, guys. The person who rolls the highest stats in one of these games always dies first. It yeah, is, absolutely. It is a curse <laughs> to have a well-endowed character. I don't know why, but it always is. All right, keep going. we got to run. we got to yeah, run through him. He's uh, very well-endowed. Let's see what his dex mm, is. 15. Oh, not bad. Holy fucking not shit. Not bad, the guy says. <laughs> Take it. Are we rolling gold, John? Did you say we were rolling gold? Yeah, we're going to roll gold, yeah. That's what Matt's doing. Oh, oh, there it is. oh no, there's there the There's the old oh, snare. There it is. Oh, we're yeah. gone. Yeah, it's a little squishy. <laughs> oh. You can, you can swap over. Now we're rethinking that fighter thing, aren't we? We're thinking that Intelli <laughs> 17 is looking pretty juicy. No, do it. Be a glass <laughs> cannon. Yeah. John, yeah. if you let me uh, roll twice my gold amount, I'll take ones and all my stats. <laughs> <laughs> Devil's bargain. All right. I'll, I'll do the Faust. <laughs> and. My charisma. Oh, right. okay. Pretty average. Pretty average. And okay. Okay. Cool. Um, so let's uh, let's just we'll character. stop right there and we'll move to uh, the next person who is going to be. Uh, let's make it Ted. All right. Um, which which method would you like, Ted? Well, I think I'm going to go with the same one. Um, I liked the idea of, of the traditional 3D6 thing, but uh, I see the value in the, like, take it or leave it scenario here. Mm -hmm. uh, so so why don't we do that? Okay. Uh, okay. And then plus six. Cool. All right. I like your dice, but... 16 plus 6 okay intelligence Ten. perfectly reasonable cool. oops 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 not 110 okay. I was trying to use the dice so nice app to make uh, exact replicas of the Holmes dice but you can't actually make them multicolor they all have to be the same color it's kind of a bummer oh yeah Ooh. 16 Father Ted. What, 12? 12, 12 decks. Okay. Still looking pretty juicy okay. for a for a cleric. Maybe a maybe a warden. Oh, look at that. 14. You can have hot cock dice virtually. <laughs> Fourteen. Last one. Wow. Nice. This is better than all of my hole in the oak characters added together. Yeah, yeah. it's a it's, a, it's <laughs> definitely weighs in your favor. Uh okay, so fourteen. Cool. Huh. Interesting. I gotta think about this now. Oh, and we can okay. swap one pair, right? Two, yeah. You can yeah, you can swap any. Any one pair. Yeah, not one pair, right. Okay. Uh David, you okay. up. Mike, we're boned. They both got really good rolls. <laughs> I'm not bummed, man. I'm happy. They're, they're gonna help keep us alive. I'm kidding. All right, David. Of course. Which one are you using? <laughs> you, have a, of course, of course. you have a high developed sense of, of Schadenfreude. Of course I'm using two D six plus six. Okay. First roll. Oh, I didn't hit slash R. Sorry. Damn. Oh, oh. Right. tasty. Right. I feel like these dice are uh, second roll. Uh, loving us up tonight. Third roll. I don't like that I have to go last. Fucking shit. Oh, 17 wisdom, seven. Okay. Who keep going though? Come on. Nice, what's, nice. What's the dex? What's the, ooh, not a not a good well, eleven. I guess that's not terrible. You're not gonna die from tripping. Oh, eh. Okay, Con. Yeah, what's the bad. chaw? What's the chaw? Ooh. Ooh, okay. Only a ten chaw. <laughs> All right. That's not a that's not a terrible block. It's still yeah. <laughs> Look at how quickly we were all like, it's not terrible. I got two seventeen. No, 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 no. This is this is a really this is a, this is two seven it's a really good, really good block. Uh without a doubt. Uh, I was right. expecting a few sixes. Although it's plus six is the thing. Yeah. Well now I feel uh did I rob myself of a really bad score? I guess I did. Wait. 
Yeah, you did. That's the whole point of this particular set. Oh, wait. Hold on. Hold on. I wanted to roll the one where I could fail worse. That's 3d6. It you, is. You can, you can get much worse scores, but if your total is... And it's your choice. If your total bonuses um, would be plus one or... Uh, um, then you can re-roll everything. <clears throat> if he wants to trash a set of stats that are, have two 17s in them, I say let him do it. <laughs> <laughs> let him do it. Hey, you know what? You <laughs> should... In my what? mind's eye, so okay, hold pressure, on. Pressure, man, the pressure. In you my gotta... mind's eye, I think I misunderstood. In my mind's eye, I was interpreting the two d six plus six because I didn't actually think about the plus six component of this. Yeah, that's as that's... being a situation in which the cap was higher, but the bottom was lower, and instead the cap and the bottom are lower. Everything is better. Oh, you yeah. can't reroll. Yeah, every everything is better. Oh, cap... You can't reroll your two seventeen. So you're correct. <laughs> cap is the same yeah just th th that's 18. why that's why i put the charts up link so if you if you open up both charts it's it's a really good comparison the 3d6 bell curve is much gentler than the 2d6 plus six cap um, is the same the base is that is is higher yeah because you're yes. basically gonna roll you're gonna roll an eight to an 18 yeah yeah somewhere in there but you have a as much opposed to being able to roll a three to an 18 You have significantly larger chances of, of getting higher higher scores than three d six. Okay, just it's. I, I kind of want to. It's fine. Dude's gonna die anyway. Right. It's okay. Mike, hey, your go, turn. go 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 go. <laughs> Mike, it's your turn. Is it my turn, John. It's your turn. Yep. Yeah. Which? Okay. Two d six plus six. Okay. All right. Thirteen for strength. So thirteen. Mm -hmm. I'll let you plus 11 for intelligence. I thought I could just copy and paste the uh, 2d6. Dice trace your friend right at the bottom. I'm using it. 10. Poor Mike. <laughs> That's all right. I'm not fussed. No one's gotten an 18 yet, though, even though there's a half decent chance of getting it. Good, good. You guys used up all the magic on the die roller. 14. Yeah. 11. Can he pull it out with a crazy high charisma? <laughs> 10 All right. wow that is mediocre you got a pretty good deck though mediocre. <laughs> mediocre okay so um next up you're going to try to choose your classes so look at your house rules you can see what's available um now uh you have to make sure that if you, when you are looking up the class stats in the player's tome or the or carcass crawler, that you have to remember where my house rules take precedence over certain things, right? Or how the stats that are listed in the class descriptions reflect uh, how they will affect certain class descriptions. In other words, like if you choose um, Mike, for instance, like if you choose Thief for your dex guy, uh, for your guy. Uh, you have dex as your prime requisite, which means that you can therefore dual wield, right? So that's just things we want to kind of keep in mind. Now, a big thing that you guys want to do whenever you're looking at what classes you want to play for a campaign versus hole in the oak, sort of fly by the seat of our pants sort of thing, are the XP requirements for getting to next level, right? Matt might be something that you, you might not be as familiar with is the fact that isn't, there is no unified XP chart. Every class um, requires a different amount of XP to raise uh, and level. Um, and it's usually commensurate with the uh, the amount of special abilities that they have, right? So the easiest to go up is um, thieves, uh, by far. They have like twelve hundred to get to second XP. The hardest um, used to be elves, which were four thousand because they were basically a combination of the best parts of fighter and magic user. But don't have to worry about that. So in the spread that we're talking about, I think some of the more obscure first edition classes, like the. Um, uh, the mm. ranger maybe might be higher than like a, a magic user is 2500 which used to be the highest for human classes but i think there might be one or two that are like 2750 
So just be aware that if when you're looking at all the cool shit that thing that classes can do, level, that that is probably slow. going to be that you're, you know, it's you're going to be leveling slower slower than other classes. Okay. Well, guys, my stats not being all that awesome, I'm gonna play a thief. Hell yeah! Okay. Great, yeah. I'm looking around. I'm reading that mage description now because I have two seventeens that I could throw into. And don't forget that you, Mike, too. If you don't have to play a thief, if you can switch any two ability scores, so if you want to put that fourteen in strength and play a fighter, exactly. No, not a problem. I'm good. It's fine. Um, the bard, I mean, by the way. My big question was whether or not to do a thief or an assassin. Those are my big questions. Gotcha. So, question for anyone that might be looking at barbarian, John. It says a lot in the skill descriptions that when in the wilderness, how are you defining wilderness? Not a dungeon. Not a dungeon. Yeah. So just yeah. just be aware. Yeah. So most of those, most of those abilities aren't actually um, viable. Yeah, you said warden and barbarian are affected now. Oh no, it, druid was druid, the other yeah. one. I got. Yeah, but probably, yeah, I probably should have put uh, barbarian in there too. Um, well, clerics are appealing to me. Mage is appealing to me. A fighter is appealing. Well, it doesn't matter. We need a list. Let's all let's all read a bit. I don't I don't know why I'm. No, feel free to talk about yourselves. You definitely want to like talk about group synergy and stuff like that and balance it out. Yeah. Uh -huh. Normally, I would just do a core class, but I don't really know the expanded class lists, so I'm looking at them real yeah, quick. Yeah, take a look. Um, another big thing is the the rule that I allow you to, ch to swip any two, two ability scores basically means that you can really work on team synergy, right, mm -hmm. you, um, as far as making sure that your niches are filled. So you don't have to. I'm, I'm all for, like, a single, single sort of theme as well, but um, you can kind of keep that in mind. Mm-hmm. Uh, but let me know what you guys end up choosing for classes, and uh, I can help you fill things out. Uh, I'm not going to do bard. Did, I'm not going to do a barbarian the, or assassin. How does the target number for assassination work, John, um, if it says zero under the thing? You can't actually do it at first level then, right? Uh, let me check here. Uh No, uh, no, it, it, you can. It's uh, that's the um, that is the penalty that the victim has to its saving throw versus death. So oh. if you if you can sneak oh. up, if you can sneak up on a guy from behind, you get you get plus four to hit, which is pretty sweet. If you mm -hmm. hit the guy, your victim has to make a save versus death with that penalty. Or listed. die. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I'm actually going to be an assassin. Oh. There you go. Question, John. Um, for the for the um, abilities that an assassin has that are like a thief, are you going to use that two d six roll? Yes. Okay. Yes, I think I changed the. I may have. I think yeah, I did. I that. Maybe I didn't. I don't think I did. Stop me out. I didn't. <laughs> uh, could you give me a, uh, if it's possible, I can read through them, but just for the sake of time, could you give me a quick uh, magic user versus illusionist versus mage? rundown mage doesn't have any spells at all yeah mage, mage doesn't have any spells mage is um very unique in play uh it actually plays more like a thief um as far as like uh you know you have special abilities that you can always use but they're they're an mage extremely skills. limited set yeah. like that's all you get right yeah um i have to say i'm personally david I, you know if you want to be a mage that's great i'm if you don't do it i'm gonna yeah, <laughs> that's. I figured you and I were both Iron Mage. <laughs> yeah, if I swap um, my strength and intelligence scores, I get the uh, the ten percent XP bonus on yeah, Mage too. Likewise. So I did. So, I did actually do the work on the assassin. So if you go into the open book section, the journal, um, I just shared the assassin, and I basically had made that. Uh, if you scroll down to the bottom, I have changed the skills to the two um, D six target numbers. So. Mike, if you're playing an assassin, okay. you're going to want to refer to that. I don't... Oh, there it is. Got it. So there are some nuances to um, actually adding this information to your character sheet. So um, for now, just do me a favor and just choose what you want to play. Um, and then I can help you guys kind of work through what um, how to take advantage of the sheet itself. Actually, I, I, I lied, dude. I'm just going to play straight Thief. Thief instead? Okay. 
Question, John. And I, I suspect I know the answer, but I'll ask it anyway. Mm -hmm. it, for things like a wizard or um, a mage or an illusionist who normally cannot wear armor, could they wear a helmet? Uh, like Merlin in Excalibur and his little silver hat. That he wears. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, yeah. I don't think, based upon the mechanics, that, that that's a big deal. I, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. So the illusionist is an alternate version mm -hmm. of a magic user, I presume. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very much Basically a first edition thing. Out. They, they ended still up... have a spell list, right? Yeah, they have their mm -hmm. own discrete spell list, which so there are a lot mm -hmm. of spells that illusionists can use that magic use. This is the big difference between illusionists and mm -hmm. first edition versus all other editions that there are spells that only the illusionist can cast um, that the magic user never has access to. Which sounds awesome, but I always play illusionists i was like, i was I thinking think about I, I was just eyeing illusionists so that do it then yeah do it bring you I'm not up. Going to. yeah i was wondering john so it says that um you know illusionists uh can't use uh shields but could they do a wield uh no they can't if they if they cannot use their shield okay i mean can they can they deal wield, do wield with with weapons? wield with uh that two daggers. No, because their prime requisite is int. So only if you are strength or dex prime requisite oh, can you do Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah, prime requisite is int, but they have to have a certain dexterity to be able to do the spells. Now, the is one that thing they're... that has a benefit for spellcasters from my house rules is that, unlike where the illusionist says the weapons are only dagger or staff, that oh. is now open up to everything. You can use all weapons. But it'll just do a d4. It'll just do a d4. That's correct. Like trebuchet? A trebuchet, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> You're going to be a master trebuchet illusionist. Only does D4, but it's a <laughs> fucking trebuchet. It's... It hurls illusions. It's... <laughs> yeah. it's not really a trebuchet. It looks like the heads of your enemies, but... <laughs> <laughs> Just a rock. So, um, I'm, uh, I'm shopping for advice on uh, my skill swap. So if, if I want to do illusionist... I'm already pretty. I'm already great with. Uh, I've got good int. Um, uh, I hate having such a low con uh, because mm -hmm. I'm gonna die. Um, mm -hmm. So, so uh, I, I need my I need my decks to be where it is for this to work. Couldn't swap that. Like swapping my con and my wisdom would bump it up a little bit. My wisdom would only be an eight. A con would be a twelve. At least I'd get some kind of bonus there. Although I, I I'm, I'm also just nervous about. I could, I could, could swap my con with my strength, but then I wouldn't be strong enough to carry my own coins out of the dungeon. No, you're. Oh yeah. Well, okay. that's um the, your your encumbrance I, um, limits are not determined by strength so um oh uh you don't have to worry about that uh yeah. one thing that you guys should all do is if you hover over the little icon of your avatar there in the upper left you'll see a little book icon and if you if you click that that are the modifiers that um your your stats um apply to so you can kind of see Ooh. right oh i see these are all the, so you can kind of judge what's what's important right oh, okay now. good yeah because i couldn't i couldn't really it was it was hard to judge to know what i was going to be hurt yeah. for in pure so, in pure ose your stats mean very little um they don't have uh they, they you know the, the spread range is only from like minus three to plus three um but even that is not it doesn't really determine a lot um uh, but the way that my house rules have it, they are a little bit more important. I gave you guys that a little bit so that, you know, you, um, so you should probably take a look at, like, you know, like now that um, uh, if you're a thief with thief skills, for instance, um, your dex initiative bonus can be added to that. To that. Um, your intelligence is going to determine your starting um, spells and your ability to copy spells if you're an illusionist or your magic user, right? Mm -hmm. um, things like that. John, I swapped my con and my strength. Your con and your strength, okay. Also, should I be adding my abilities onto my character sheet or no? Because I was 
just from that. Yeah, that's what I was going to go into and stuff. But yeah, um, so uh, yeah, once you have your, oops, once you have your, um, <laughs> well, that's a relief. Yeah, right. Not mean to hit that. Go to self roll, John. Okay. Um, uh, once you have your, your class chosen, what you can then do, uh, which is pretty nifty is that you can fill in the values according to the chart on the front there. So you want to fill in your saving throw values, right? Straight down. Um, the bonus versus magic one is just what you get um, if you if your wisdom grants you a bonus, right? To, to saves versus magic. That's where you would apply that. Um, you want to input your hit die, what your listed Thacko is. I believe it's 19 for everybody to start. Um, and your movement rates will be calculated based upon your, will automatically be calculated based upon your encumbrance, which is really nice. Um, AC will be calculated based upon your um, your decks and your uh, carried armor, your equipped armor. Um, but why don't we move to another role and actually do some hit points here before we move to abilities. Has everyone chosen a class? No, I'm waiting on David. Oh. I, which I don't mean is pressure on David, but <laughs> well, okay. So Matt, you're doing illusionist. I will, I will be an illusionist. Mike, Mike's a thief. You're doing you're doing thief. Yep. I was interested in mage and cleric. Ted, you're interested in mage. Yeah, but mage. I honestly I'll play whatever, and and yeah, this would be a good. I could I could do a fighter with this, or I could do a cleric with this, and. Uh, Ted, why don't you do mage? I know you. Mage. I know you want to play mage. Be a mage. All right. I'll be a mage. I, I like it, but I think you have the uh, uh, vital of a mage. Uh, I have the gravitas of John Huston as Gandalf in the animated Hobbit. Is that what you're saying? You nice. Uh, I love yeah. it. Um, More like so... the Chinatown John Huston. Ooh, Ted. Dang. Yeah, you. you All right, be a mage. You sure? Uh, no, but do it. Do it. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. So, it's fine. All right, going uh, into the dungeon without any fighters. I like it. Well, oh, this is well, this is what I, well, this, this is what I brought it up because I'm thinking, does one of us need to be a fighter? Which is why I wanted to know what Ted wanted to be other than a mage. Do it, David. You I, never I'll be a fighter. Fighters. What's that? You never play fighters. I never be a fighter. I thinking, so that's what I was thinking. I was like, I'm always playing a, a magic caster, but mage sounds so cool. But I think I'm going to play a cleric or a fighter. But yeah, maybe I just play a fucking pure fighter. Maybe I think or you could play like another. Do person. Really, you, you could do barbarian. Do we want or... really want the most combat averse person in our party to play the fighter. <laughs> we might. We, so might. Yeah, we, exactly. may, we may want to do that. <laughs> that might give me a lot of power in dictating our choices, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Mike's like, I'm playing a fighter. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, so I'm, I'm between cleric and fighter. I feel both good about both of them. Let me read them real quick, just so I have a sense. I pretty much know them from... Cause you didn't it, change it would be awesome world. to have a cleric. Uh, another big thing is that um, swords specifically are a much bigger deal in uh, BX than other editions, um, and uh, certain swords, certain things can only be wielded by fighters, which includes like um, intelligent swords and things like that. So um, uh, that's a, well, I was yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, as it, it's sort of like an unwritten thing that a lot of people don't realize that fighters have. They kind of see them as the most boring class, but um, they have actually have access to some of the best um, magical weaponry. And armor. Well, and I was going to say, I want to reread your contextual house rules when it, as they... Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, if, if, if you haven't noticed, well. um, you guys, even the three of you who were talking with me about weapon traits, um, I added another one um, that only the sword has. Uh, not the short sword, not a dagger, not a two-handed sword, but only the sword is noble, um, which is sort of like a, sort of a campaign-specific trait, is that um, you get a plus one to reaction checks um, if you are openly uh, wearing the sword or brandishing it, so swords, um, I'm really going to try to lean into like the, the the favor that is given to swords versus other weapons in in original D and D. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that they are considered to be basically better than other weapons, like you know what I mean. Like they are, um, they are the weapon of someone who is is moneyed or skilled, um, mm, you know, gotcha. or, or something like that, right? Um, I suspect because and this is also why I was thinking about fighter. 
because I love contextual weapon rules, and you've done such a great job of creating them. And all these guys decided they wanted to play squishies. <laughs> that, I think, because a cleric can only use blunt weapons, so I, that that means I wouldn't be able to use pole arms. The pole arms. Right, but clerics clerics have access to. I've tried to. This is the thing, right? So, well, fighters have access to everything, so whatever. Yeah. But yeah. clerics can use um, maces and um, warhammers and. Uh, uh, what was I thinking of? Flails. Flails. Right? Yeah. They, they, I think the warhammer and the mace are the ones I'm thinking of, where they each do da- they do damage. Um, they have an extra plus one to hit versus certain types of armor. Um, denting. Cr- crushing or denting. Yeah. Plate armor, which I love. Rattle some brains. And I got that through Ted. Ted. Ted had a long talk with me about what would be. I good... love the historical use of warhammers. They are both uh, much smaller than fantasy depictions and much cooler, in my opinion. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> like right. the, the little this icons. Concentration of just like. <laughs> right? like yeah. Cool. I actually didn't know until we started talking to the session. I I don't know why. I thought flails were purely fictitious and and fantasy medieval. That's the morning star that's fictitious. That's the morning star that's fictitious. Yeah, the big spiked right. ball on a chain. Yeah. No. Oh, but and my flail, are a thing. my flail, by the way, is definitely like a footman's flail. It's not a horse, a horseman's flail. So it, is, right, it yeah. does have the two handed property. You got to wield that. Flail yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Um, base AC should be 10, right, John? Nine. It's actually nine. And oh, it is nine. Okay. So how do I modify it? I don't seem to be able to access it. It'll do it automatically with your decks, um, but it will. Um, if you if you get armor and equip it, it will then change it. Yeah, so I have mage armor. Is that an item that I can pull out and equip? No. For the mage, Ted, we're going to have to do some special stuff with you because I don't have any automated stuff for it. Okay. And I didn't want to. Uh, I didn't want to um, invest the time to do it if I, if no one was going to take it. Um, so um, I love that you took it, but you're you're gonna you're gonna be a little bit of a disadvantage towards everyone else's because I'm going to have to um, until I actually get the stuff input. Uh, Joe, okay. Sorry, one more question. Yeah. Oh, no, go ahead, Ted. You first. Nope. I was just saying, okay. Oh, here we go. Okay. No, I was just looking for the weapon list so I could relate it to the trade list. So, sword, melee, quick draw, noble. Gotcha. 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 Polar, melee, two handed, reach, deadly. All right. Cat, meowing. All right, so I guess it's only Mike who can basically do this because I only have the, f- the abilities for the four basic classes. But Mike, in the meantime, while Dave is figuring it out, um, you can um, open up abilities. Uh, uh, go, uh, uh, I'm sorry, in the briefcase under classes, well. abilities, thief, you basically are going to pull every single one of those things um, into your thing, and they will auto-populate into okay. your abilities tab. I didn't, I didn't bother pulling over the after-reaching ninth level things, you, but yeah, just drag if them you all think in. it's better just to grab them all over, I will. Yeah, because they're literally, it's it's literally the entire class description, uh, you know, it, it, as discrete things. So you might as well just pull them all over, <clears throat> gotcha. and then and then you can easily even the thief level progression is a nice one to have because then you can easily just find it right on your character sheet and you know keep tabs. Got it. Uh, and it's really nice. And then you can see that I have modified those to be the 2D10. Um, so you don't even have to worry about it. Uh, for those of you who are spellcasters, so that would be Matt only right now, um, you're going to go, Matt, you're going to go into tweaks up at the t- very top of your character sheet. Yeah, okay. And you're I knew it was somewhere, yeah. Yeah, you remember this from Golden Fang. Um, yeah. Spellcaster, you're going to click that. Okay. Yeah. Um, everybody um, should go into tweaks, and you're going to want to change your next level XP to the appropriate amount. <clears throat> and you're going to want to check for bonus experience. If you meet the requirements for getting bonus experience, it's very important that you do that. Um, should you have high I don't. I'm sorry. What do you mean tweaks? Oh, at the top. Mm-hmm. Got it. Never mind. I'm an idiot. So Matt, oh, I can add my armor class bonus right here, John. Mm-hmm. In tweaks, I can add an armor class bonus. All oh, right, yeah, yeah. There you go. And so, John, just Sweet. confirm for me mm-hmm. what I'm seeing is that with my 14 
dex i get a five percent experience point bonus is that what you're saying is that right uh for a thief it sounds right I'll take a look here thief and am i misreading it or do i not see do i not get one what are you again illusionist illusionist uh, armor weapon language so language. you should get one for your intelligence if that's your i would theory. think yeah. so i'm just i don't see it's where it's, it's located it's under it's ability scores in the, yeah it's under ability scores not in your class description some classes get additional stuff if they have more than one prereq that is above a certain number but it would say that in your in your class description oh, yeah. then yeah page 20 so uh Yeah, where does it say for the individual class, though? I don't see it now. Um, it just says if characters with a single prime requisite. Uh, huh, actually. Oh, yeah, here it is. It's in the bottom right corner of page 21. Prime requisite modifiers. So if you have a prime requisite of int, what's your int? 17, baby. You get, you get plus 10%. There you go. Uh, nice. Some classes require you to have um, high scores and two abilities, though, so just be aware. Make sure you take a look at what your class's prime requisites are. Yeah, the mage is like that, but I swapped my strength and my uh, int, and that puts me in the plus 10% category. Cool. So. Yep, so. Uh, I put that in my tweaks. Yeah, so if you're a spellcaster, click that in tweaks, and then you're, everyone should put their next level XP in tweaks. Um, bonus oh, XP. Shoot, just... Encumbrance. So I don't Encumbr technically count as a spellcaster, right? Even though I have no, some powers. That's correct, yeah. It would give right. you the spellcasting tab, but you don't need because you don't actually use... Um, you don't actually oh, use. shit. My my XP level is 2,800. Yeah, be careful. Yeah, this is what I'm saying. Like, they're fun, but there's a reason. All right. It's all right. It'll just take me longer to max out. I keep playing longer. Okay, just a heads up for time. We're at eleven thirty, so we have a half hour left. Right, I'll uh, be I'll be third level by the time Ted hits second. It's <laughs> it's it's true. Okay, uh, uh, quick question before I do the final decision here. I was just rereading everything real quick. Um, your conception of the clerics within this world? They're zealots. They're kind of crazy. There is a single Catholic adjacent sort of pantheon of saints but it is more or less a monotheism yes that's correct okay uh and uh uh they're weirdos okay yeah adventuring adventuring priests are weirdos yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, gotcha. your average the average um priesthood is you know you basically basically picture like catholics uh, stuff those catholics yeah. <sighs> <laughs> but there's much more it's even more heavy towards like um, uh, propitiating saints. Um, no, 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 I got gotcha. you. Than your, oh, yeah. than even, than even um, diehard Catholics. Yeah, they reference, they re they worship, um, they, and they make, they do prayers to saints more often than they do prayers to God. I love it. You know, I'm into that. Uh, all right, cool. So, all right, all right, uh, and uh, uh, I think I'm going to play a fighter. Um, one other question would be AC calculation as it relates to Dex. Hold on, Foundry's freezing for me for some reason. God, why are you, why are you doing this? Stop bugging out. You just refresh. I fixed it. Cool. All right, cool. Yeah, I'm gonna play fighter. Cool. Uh, I just need to figure out if I need. I only have 13 con, and 11 Dex is the problem, so I won't be a great fighter as a tank uh so 17 strength 17 wisdom 13 why don't you, it's still why don't you move that wisdom why don't you move that wisdom to your con well i'm debating whether to put it into my decks or my con because i have 11 decks so i'm gonna get hit real easy so well, that you guys, you guys are already thinking it, in like more modern games like yeah yeah it doesn't work out quite that way yeah 3d think about like what your chances of getting that set in 3d6 would would be you know what i mean like a 13 con for a fighter is like absolutely stellar 
you know what I mean? Like, you know, especially if, you're, okay. if you've got it backed up with like a 17 strength, which is fucking unheard of. Cool. But I, 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 I almost not looking at these stats. Amazing. I almost regret giving you the option of doing 2d6 plus six. That's how. That's what I was saying. Well, earlier I was, I kind of was hoping I'd roll a yeah. three on something. We're all pretty powerful. Yeah. I'm not. I'm average. I'm strictly average. I'm slightly again, above average. I, I reserve the right to change rules. So one of the very first to go might be next characters might be 3d6 only. I'm happy to reroll as a 3d6 no, so that fine. I have a good... Uh, okay. All right. So let's uh, let's <laughs> move on so we can get the, the core of these characters done. So let's do hit point rolls. Yeah. Um, let's do it oh, real okay. quick. So remember, you're going to take the average 3, 4, or 5 at the minimum. So David, let's go first with you. You are a fighter, so you're going to roll a d8. You have a con of 13, which I believe gives you... Well, hold what? on. I'm, I'm trying to figure out where I'm going to put my wisdom, because I don't need a 17 wisdom. So... All right, skip let's, him. Let's skip Matt. Yeah. Matt, you are a illusionist? An illusionist? I got a D4, baby. D4. All right. Your con, though, is high, so you get a plus two to that con, which is pretty yeah, sweet. Yeah, I uh, would like to stay alive. Okay, I'm going to roll D4. All right. Minimum is three, though, so you don't got much to worry about. Is there a way to... All right, so you got five hit points. So write that puppy down. Um, I believe the... Yeah, the maximum is the larger number. And the hit point value there. Mike, you are a thief. You also roll a d4. <laughs> so... Do you get a I plus get a one? four. Yeah, I do. For, I, I move my con up to 13. Okay, cool. Swapped it with my strength. All right, so, yeah. so you got a four. So, yeah, I'll get four. Four, all right. Ted, you are a mage. What do you roll, d6? D6, yeah. Cool. You also have a bonus. Also, oh. I, I think the maximum, John, is the lower number. Oh, is that right? Okay. Yeah, so the lower you, number. Is it... You have a four plus one, so you have five hit points, Ted. Okay. David? I'm, so, I'm still trying to figure this out. I can't remember how this works. What? The, the dex and and uh, armor thing. So so I, I, it's descending AC, but then the AAC value is the maximum. No, AAC no. is a set, ascending armor class. So you don't have to Okay, worry. so it is just the ascending versus the descending. They list both. Yeah. Okay, okay. So uh, so where where is the chart for... Hold on, I'm looking through our things. For uh, dex. Why can't I open armor. the... I can't open your things. Okay, okay. player tome. There we go. Player tome. I just want to make sure I, I'm remembering this correctly because I haven't played OSC in ages. So that's why. Uh, okay, player tome, weapons and armor. Uh, uh, okay, uh, weapons and armor. Armor, plate mail, L3, in parentheses 16, so that's the AC and the ACC. There's no dex value. No. So dex doesn't even come to account. I, but it says in the chart for ability scores it does, I yeah, thought. So. Yeah, it, it, there's no... Your AC is determined by the armor you wear. So if you're wearing yes. plate, you have a three. And then if your dex is high enough, you can lower that even further. So it's always worthwhile to have higher dex. Yes. No, uh, armor, in no this gap. edition, armor, your armor does not, is okay. not is, your dex is not affected by armor. So I'd rather have a 17 dex than a 17 con, honestly. So I'm going to go 17 dex, 11 wisdom. Cool. All right. Okay. So roll for your points, please. You have a D8. Um, and you have a con modifier of what plus one? Yeah, plus so one. d8 plus yeah. one, you have a minimum of five. So you're gonna have five plus one, so you're gonna be six hit points. Cool. 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 Oh. John, I have a quick question about my character sheet. Uh huh. Um, on the front page, I, I entered into my tweaks that I had a plus one in missile attacks because of my decks. But uh, I'm looking yeah. at the front page of my sheet, and for some reason, it's giving me an additional plus one. Right, because that that's and a, I. That, oh, that go is, ahead. That is uh, that is a general modifier. Your your bonuses from your ability scores will automatically be applied to anywhere on the sheet that that, that they're necessary. So you don't need to put missile bonus plus one in in the tweaks. See what I'm saying? So take it out. So take it out. Yeah. Okay. That's I like, just filled out all the boxes. You know. Yeah, gotta fill out the boxes. But you don't, you don't need to fill out the boxes. Is what I'm saying, right? So, so don't, don't add, don't add the initiative bonus one no, or any of that stuff. Then. No, none of it. That's that's those are overriding bonuses in addition to what you would normally get, right? Like if you're getting it from like a magic ring or something like that, 
Got you. Okay, okay. Thank you for that yeah. explanation. And and I think that settles me then. Right. Okay. So take away initiative, missile, armor. Mm -hmm. yeah. Got it. Cool. Everything makes sense now. <clears throat> okay. So um, David, uh, in a, you're just like Mike. So what you can do, David, is um, go to your abilities tab. Mm -hmm. Then on the upper right, open up the briefcase, go into classes, fighter, and just pull all... Oh, that's another thing I got to explain about fighter. It's super cool. You're going to like it. You're going to like it. Um, cannot wait. You're gonna pull. You're gonna pull all five of those abilities in. What you're gonna see, one of them is cleave. Um, this is an ability that all fighters get, but only fighters. Nobody else. When a fighter drops an opponent to zero hit points with a melee weapon, you can immediately make an attack against another opponent within his reach. This ability can be chained. So it's very similar to third edition cleave feat, right? But you can just awesome. do it all the time, right? Awesome. All right. So as long as you keep killing enemies, um, you can keep attacking. Good thing I'm such a pacifist, pacifist player. <laughs> they are, they are me melee attacks only, right? And they have to be within cool. reach. So it's That's basically like, it's like a mook killer. So yeah, I basically, yeah, 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 my yeah. impression of the fighter, like the like my ideal, platonic ideal of fighter, as you guys all probably well know by now, is um, Frazetta's Deathbringer standing upon the pile of corpses. There you um, go, and that's what I—that's what I want. Like the ideal high-level fighter to look like after every battle is just like having laid waste to like a Dude, bunch of mixed, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so the the one that. where he's on the horse. Uh, I think there's one where uh, actually I think it might be like undead creatures crowing up towards him, but he's sort of standing. Oh yeah, that one. And he's got the axe. He's holding the axe down. Yeah. 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 Not the one that's on the Molly Hatchet cover. The Molly Hatchet is cover my, is dope. It's I super cool. I love that yeah, thing. So yeah. yeah, anything that he did with Death Dealer was just was just awesome. You know, uh, oh, what was that? Well, again, I'm getting off topic. Sorry. Go ahead, John. Okay, let's, so um, so let's pull all those abilities over. Um, uh, Matt and and um, I'm sorry, uh, Ted. Uh, we'll we'll have to work on that outside of the session um in order to get your stuff built up yeah i'm sorry about that i just yeah. don't have like the automatic stuff for the some of the more obscure yeah stuff. i was, I was no, just no. i was just writing what yeah. was listed for illusionist okay so uh next up let's do some sorry real quick question too yep i'm sorry so when i took out those things from tweaks now i have something under melee and missile it says n-a-n n-a-n for twig yeah no, probably just not alchemical. I'm sure it's fine. Yeah. Okay. 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 So um, let's try do... replacing it with a zero, Mike. In the tweaks. Yeah, oh, in the tweaks. I think you're right. I think that's what I did. Okay. <clears throat> Hold on one second. Sorry, John. That's let's okay. do it. That's okay. All right. So. Hey, you're you're a genius. I'm here for you, Mike. I love you, man. I love you too. Uh, let's do starting gold, shall we? Yes. I can't wait to loot your corpse. Thank you. Uh, I wouldn't have it any other way. I can't wait to have too much grog and put an axe in all of your heads. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Oh, man. All right. So, um, oh, you got to choose your alignment. So we're, there's only three alignments in this game. Lawful, neutral, or chaotic. Pretty self-explanatory oh. if you have any issues with that. I'm just ask me it's not a big deal but you should know what those are um uh you gotta buy equipment okay so equipment um everyone needs to roll 3d6 times 10 that's what you get there is no re-rolling it is what oh it boys. is no pressure so whoever wants to go who that mike got 120 mike. gold <laughs> very nice 230 no, 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 no. Plus ten did or times plus ten. Oh, three d six plus ten. So we so rolled uh, thirteen. Wait, you have a three d six plus ten? No, no, I on. did I plus ten. Yeah, hold on, it's a, it, it's fine. David, David got one hundred and thirty gold. Yeah, who's up next? Mm -hmm. Matt's got one hundred and thirty. Right. So it's just roll three d six times ten. Just, just, just roll three d six. All right, all right, all right, all right. All right, all right, all right. All right. 130. Okay, cool. So, um, equipment. Uh, basically, what you're going to do is you're going to uh, shop. Don't shop from the book because the book has directly been translated into pullable items by yours truly. So, um, forget the book. Go into the briefcase, um, equipment, adventuring gear, and all of that is listed right there. Adventuring gear, armor, and weapons is what you're looking at. Okay. Okay. Now, 
when you are done okay so you can literally just pull those in right they don't have to be you yeah know, they'll, they'll auto populate um they will not automatically deduct their cost from your from your gold total so what i would do is make a note make a journal entry note of your or something like that of your coins or write it down on a piece of paper and keep track of your expenditures as you buy things um and then when you're done what you're going to do is when you have your remaining gold you're going to open up coins gems and jewelry and you can see i've got like nice little icons for those and you're going to pull in gold into and you'll see it will auto populate in treasure and actually apply a weight and then you have to adjust the quantity okay. where oh an equipment oh i see okay you see what i'm saying but you're gonna do that last because right now you're gonna keep track of like the maximum you have right now you're gonna go shopping deduct that by hand oh i see okay because it doesn't it pulling items in doesn't automatically deduct from a from a gold piece total you understand what i'm saying can, can I ask you, there was a question earlier and I missed the answer. Um, is there, can people that only wear leather and no shields wear helmets? Yes, you can wear your helmets no matter what. Shield use is restricted though, based on the actual rule book. Where is, hold on. Okay, Where's so... the cost for weapons listed? Or is Under, it just the weight? Back? You have to open each weapon, like double click on it. You'll see it in the top right corner. Yep. And I, I highly suggest doing that for weapons because um, it will expand into yeah. showing you what each um, trait does as well. Gotcha. And once you've added it to your equipment list, you're going to have to go in and adjust its damage. That's right. You have to replace the N with your class hit die. Oh, I forgot damage was your hit yeah. die. Yeah. Don't change. If you have a plus to strength, like David, you have a plus two to strength, I believe. You're not gonna add. You're not gonna change it to like one d eight plus two. It'll automatically calculate the two. Okay. Um, I made the crossbow so, super nasty in case anyone is wondering. Um, it's deadly. Uh, oh, that's a deadly is a huge trait, important trait that you guys should be aware of. Um, it's basically advantage for damage. Right. So you don't get an advantage when you attack, but if you do hit, it's super nasty. So. You're going to roll your damage dice twice and take the higher result. So you have a much higher chance of actually rolling max damage with a deadly weapon. Um, uh, and I changed the rule for what's... Uh, 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 so I made it so it, it used to have the reload quality, which means you had to take up an entire round reloading it. I made it slow, which means you can attack it. You can, you can attack with a crossbow every round, but you always attack last in combat after everybody else attacks. Including monsters. Sorry, what's the restriction on who is using them, though? Uh, anyone can use a crossbow. There's a restriction. Except, except, except the cleric. The cleric. Yeah. They are two-handed oh, as well, so you can't use a shield. Just in... A cleric could use it, but he'd have to just, like, club somebody with it. Yeah, it would be a club. Yeah. It's cool. Yeah, there's lots of cool stuff. Uh, pole arms are really versatile um, because they have reach. They're deadly. Um they have the specialized trait, which means that only classes with strengths as a prime requisite can wield it effectively. Anyone else who uses a pole arm takes a minus four, because you got to be highly trained to use those effectively. Um, oh, oh, John, I just remembered. What spell book does my mook find? Your mook? Oh, your your main guy? You mean? Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. That guy. <laughs> he's just he's just a guy that found a book. Yeah, we have to do a spell book. Um, let's see here. Let's go into the player's tone. Oops. And he's got one spell per day, baby. I don't even have that. <laughs> he's gonna cast his spell and run away. So there's no there's no buying an adventurer's pack or anything like that, right? No. Nope. Individual. Which I like too, because you have to really think about what you really want. What you have to think. Um, so uh, so Matt, unfortunately, like some of these spells probably aren't going to be in the compendium, but um, if you go into, let's see. Um, Illusionist spells, one page one forty six. No, but in the in the in Foundry here, hold on, to be able to drag. Them. Give me a second. Spells, yeah, here it is. Okay, so um, what you're gonna do first of all, um, you're gonna go into your spells tab, Matt. Then 
you're going to go into the compendium tab in the upper right, which looks like a little book with a disc on it, like a little circle. Okay. Spells, okay. book with circle, default and item is what I see. So you're going to go to item. You'll see spells. Open that up. Search for read magic. And you could just pull that directly into your character sheet. John, where are... Hold on, I gotta log back in. Where are retainers listed? I don't see them anywhere. Uh, Under dental. I am not sure. Give me one second. Um, <laughs> Orthodontic. Yes, yeah, that's the one. Hold on one second. Special kind of mage. Are quarrels and quivers, are quarrels and arrows the same thing? Quarrels are for crossbows. No, I know that. So, but under the stats, it just says arrow quiver. Is that 20, 20 arrows? Yeah, it'll, it'll, it'll auto populate 20 for you, I believe. What's going on? I'm having computer issues. Sorry. And so, is there a quarrel? Is there a quarrel quiver? I, don't I think it's called bolt. That. There's oh, bolt quiver, I believe. Um, Matt, where is your character sheet? What is your intelligence, Matt? Um, mine or my dude's? Uh, my dude's intelligence is 17. 17. Okay, so you start with four spells. Okay, so um, you automatically get read magic, um, but you're going to roll for the other four. Okay. Okay. Obviously, repeats are not, you know, you get to reroll. Um, okay. So we're going to look at where the spell list here. They are right here. There we go. Druid illusions. Okay. All right, so you're going to roll a d12 four times. Nine. Phantasmal Force is one. Uh, so we'll search for that and see if it actually is here. It is. So you can pull Phantasmal Force um, into your character sheet. Nice. And that's pretty sweet because that's a, that's a second level magic user spell. It's first level for you. That's cool. Um, um. Okay, so roll again. Another. Auditory illusion. That one is not in the thing, so you're going to have to um, add that manually. Um, I would just okay. like, add a manual spell and just write down the name and then, you know, fill it in later. I can do that. Get it down here. Hypnotism, nice. Wait, I think I, I rolled the wrong. I rolled a d20. Sorry. Oh. Ignore that. Oh, did it again. I clear this out anyway. Pretty cool, John. This is a lot of setup you did on here. This is great. Good. I'm glad it's working. Come on. Yeah, so far, I haven't had any trouble. Except when I try and buy the Sphere of Annihilation, and that seems to it's not letting <laughs> me do that. Detect Illusion. Okay. That's helpful. Uh, looks like that one's not in there either, Matt, so you have to add that one. Okay. Thirsty Puppy. Wow. I'm thirsty. Yeah. It's a new spell. <laughs> thirsty Puppy? Thirsty puppy. <laughs> I like it. Uh, that was Detect Illusion, you said? Yep. And you got one more. All right, no repeats. Dancing lights. I'm pretty sure that's got to be in there, right? Cool. It is not. Wow. Really? What the hell? Kind of outfit you're running here. That's a good. That's a good broad selection. You got some. You got some good ones there. Okay. All right. So let's see. Let's go back up here to uh, a little bit of this action. A little bit of this. A little bit of that. Little bit of character generation. Ooh, okay. Cool. Hmm. 
Um, one thing that I am willing to do if you guys want to do it, it mostly, it would actually have some mechanical benefits, is if you want to roll secondary skills, um, it just kind of gives you a framework for what you, it's like a just a quick description of what your profession was before you um, became an adventurer. Sort of like the old school way of doing backgrounds. Um, right. But there is literally no mechanical thing like there's no like you know like backgrounds of 5e kind of give you like this nice little suite of bonuses and stuff like that right this is much more like for role playing like you could say like if you were a boy or fletcher um you know and you were looking at mysterious arrows that were littered on the ground in the cavern room i might give you a two and six chance of of finding out what the who manufactured them versus a one and six chance right things like that um but it would be it would be randomly determined basically. Um, but uh, but if you if you want to roll on it, you can. It's... I mean, I love totally background stuff. If everyone's into it, that's right up my alley. absolutely. But I mean, and but if you if you have an if you have something percolating in your mind of what of what your background profession already was, you can certainly just choose that. You don't have to roll. I'm saying, but if you do choose, where's roll, the chart, John? Uh, is on page 25 according to my thing here. Page 25, the player's tome. Yeah. It's a D100, um, but just re just remember that you are, you know, if you choose to roll, you are you are this, you know what I mean? Or you were this. Uh, so. I secondary didn't skill. What was the you page again? Uh, 25. 25. Thank you. Sick. Uh, right. Well, I always knew that my background is a, you know, a uh, right? Vintner would uh, suit me as a mage for <laughs> sure. 97. Vintner, you fucking stole my job. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I don't even know what a Vintner is. Uh, you make oh, wine. wine maker. I'm a drunk. This is perfect. This <laughs> is perfect. <laughs> I love it. Oh, look at Mike. Is a, uh, a cartographer. Man. Map maker. All nice. right. Which makes sense for a mage, actually. That fits very well. No, uh, sorry. I'm a thief. It's too bad we're not playing in person because you would definitely be the guy who is actually physically drawing the maps <laughs> if that was the case. All right, I'm gonna roll mine. I mean, I highly suggest we draw maps anyway, right? I mean, that's the furrier. D two a furrier. You're a, a furrier <laughs> mage. Yeah, what the fuck thin, are you? Man? Uh, <laughs> in All right. Well, I, guess. I uh, I was making a uh, fur coat out of a griffin and and uh, decided I'd had enough of that and. <laughs> I'm very curious what my magical illusionist yeah, exactly. started out as. Let's find out. What the fuck is that? What's a Lormer, Ted? S 66? A Lormer? You, a Lormer. You, we're just going to see. You got me. I okay, do Google. not know. I love it. That's, it's, it's, such like, it's such a Guy Gaxian thing to put in there. It's, I'm, I'm, what's a Lormer? A maker of bits, spurs, and metal mountings for bridles and saddles. Okay, there you go. Okay. Oh, I know. Oh, Mike so rolled, rolled the map maker. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah. Uh, I dealt in fur clothing. And so I don't a, know. A, Somehow uh, I ended up as a mage. We have a boozer, a map maker, a fur seller. You're a vintner. Or... You made yourself a boozer. A vintner can be an actual <laughs> a culture nice look, person look, too. Look, look. If I'm a, if I'm a fighter, I'm a, I'm absolutely uh, uh, sampling the stock. Or or perhaps I was a vintner in as much as I was hired to sort of protect the. Uh, who knows? I got to think this one out. But that's cool, go. vintner. All right. I don't know why I've never heard that term. Is that used in modern day at all? Vintner? Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Enough wine right, out so there. So then we take coins, gems, and jewelry. And. Right. So if you, you've you already bought all your gear, Ted? Yeah. Wow. Wow. I'm impressed. I haven't bought anything yet. Wow. Yeah. So you're just. Oh, I wanted to ask, though, John. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, so, Ted, you're, what you're going to do is you're going to just you're just going to drag gold into your character sheet and let it pop. Yeah. Out. Then you're going to go into the quantity of gold and you're actually going to change the quantity to whatever you have left. And you'll see that the, the first in the number in front of the slash or after, uh, I believe it's the first uh, check out your guy here. Let's see here. Yeah. First number that worked. Yeah. So you can see Ted, uh, that 
um, if you look at so at the very bottom of everyone's in inventory tab, you'll see like your your encumbrance gauge. It's it's kind of yep. cool. It actually like fills up with red according to how close you get to sixteen hundred. Um, it has calculated. Let's see. Uh, you've got the fifty one hundred and ten from one hundred and ten one hundred and sixty from your armor and weapons. Uh, then an additional eighty from all of your stuff. So that would be two hundred and forty. Right, and then 240 plus 89 should hopefully be 329. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah so that's cool. how it does it, right? It works. So it automatically works. Um, and uh, I think they did a really nice job with this. That's pretty badass. Yeah, I mean, it's not like on that crazy level that Pathfinder is, but for for the simplicity of OSC, it's, it's pretty nice, nicely done. Um, uh, John, I've, I've been wanting to ask, but we've been going through this stuff. Uh, yeah. How I spend my money will be somewhat contingent on what the retainer situation Retainer, yes, like. I'm sorry. Okay, so... Uh, That's all right. I just, you know, you know, I like retainers. So I'm going to save the money. Retainer, though. That's what, that's what, well, it, there's a negotiate. Like, in the rules within the book, it sounds like you, like, negotiate a retainer. You do, yeah. Sort of just... position. Let me but I don't know right in there. terms of the story you're talking about if that's a possibility or not, right? Without spoiling anything, so I wanted let's to ask. Uh, how, how do costs work out if they're point zero eight or something like that? I just tallied it up, and when I got up to one, I just call it one. I think it's copper, silver, you know, ten to one for gold. Hired help. Oh yeah, I knew it. It was like it should be in the players' tome. Page two hundred thirty, John. Thank you. I'm used to using the original OSC book, which has everything all in one book, so I'm not used to the uh, way this was done. I love the way this place, this thing is laid out, though. It's so fucking clear. Uh, so yeah, retainers. Um, so it basically would cost you. Um, I'm going to go with it to basically the default of one gold per day. Um, they want they want one gold per day. They want um, half a share of treasure. Uh, of all party treasure or my treasure? Of all of all party share treasure, right? Oh, that's a. Uh... Oh, one. They get, they get oh, so share, retainers like, are different than than mercenaries. Is oh yeah, saying. big time. Yeah, yeah. But mercenaries oh, okay. can't be hired. It says within the rules, out it, like within an adventure, they, they won't go adventuring with you. Only retainers will go into a dungeon and fight. Yes. So if we're playing a oh, mega okay. dungeon, we can, we're not using mercenaries. In other words, what I'm trying to figure out is, uh, I mean, personally, guys, I like having a. Uh, We can call him a squire to give him dignity, but I like having someone around to carry shit and, you know, be kind of a, a, a pack mule of sorts. That's uh, right. especially, especially in a situation in which we may be negotiating weight quite frequently. So, in my opinion, that's a worthwhile cost. I was just going to spend myself, but here's the problem. It's a half share of party treasure which is a pretty steep cost. So I think that's something worth discussing. Maybe we all don't want to do that as a result. It's a, it's a half share, right? It's, it's not half of all treasure, right? Like each of you gets a share. They get a half half a share, right? Right, oh, right. So oh, if we, if oh, we oh, find oh, a oh, thousand oh. gold, right? If we uh, find a thousand gold. Sense. Okay, yes, yeah. yes. Divided by 4.5. Yeah, if you look on 230, the actual um, shares of treasure green boxes has a good example. It makes it very clear. So... I'm going to just put a vote in and say I would highly be interested in doing that. Uh, so first. you cannot you cannot determine who it's going to be, and not only that, but you have to roll a reaction thing to see if they even accept your offer. Yes. So if you want to do... If you're offering one gold per week and half share of treasure, it'll be a straight... Um, for the, for this particular one, um, it'll be a straight uh, charisma roll. Charisma. Good thing I have a... Uh... 10 charisma <laughs> but yeah before before i make that decision guys i mean it seems like everyone's clicking around and not like do, are you all interested in that idea or i i am yeah, this is dictating whether yeah. i get gear and stuff so i wanted to talk about it first yeah we absolutely get it dude okay actually you know what i'm gonna roll to see what um uh the um 
what it is first, and then you can decide if you want to offer. How about that? How about that? That sounds great. Uh, and I am right now purchasing a lantern and oil for this person to carry. Cool. Yes, exactly. I'd essentially, what I want is a torchbearer and a gear carrier. Exactly. Um, everyone should buy oil because this stuff burns up fast. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, okay, guys, I will be right back. Just excuse me just a minute. Okay. So. Okay, so I'm basically, uh, they are rolling 3d6 for stats, and I am choosing, they have to be level 1 because they can't be higher than you. And sure. I will be going to re-roll any demi-humans I roll, just so you're aware. Okay, that's what's going on here. Okay. Um, I have rolled um, Artemidoros, who is a first level, a uh, male first level cleric. <laughs> well, oh, there you go. Yeah, he, he has seven hit points. Um, he's uh, wielding a hammer, and he's got chain and a shield. Um, and he's got uh, a decent. He's got a decent arrangement of starting equipment. Our he appears to be, be better than me. <laughs> he's a little rough around the edges as far as his. Uh, as let's see, what's he got here? Um, so strength eleven, intelligence seven. Wisdom is 13. <laughs> uh, his dex is 9. His con, his con is 15, and his charisma is 14. And he's a total weirdo, because he's a, he's a zealot. I'm yeah. going to be giving this guy so much wine um, to the adventure. Um, well, uh, personally, guys, I mean, it is nice to have a cleric around if they have a heal spell. I'm not, I'm not looking for a retainer for the purpose of their combat potency. I'm mostly looking for someone to carry stuff. So I'm okay with this, and having someone who can cast Cure on us is not a bad backup right i mean that seems right. pretty pretty valuable to us even if he isn't i wouldn't put him in the front of the line anywhere to fight right like that seems but he easy. can fight though right john like as yeah. a retainer he yeah. can yeah. Yeah. participate now, in combat yeah but if um if he's put into a dangerous situation in which combat is one he, the, a loyalty check has to be made or else he'll yeah, leave. exactly uh also i have a low charisma I don't know what everyone else's charisma is, but that will predict that'll that'll dictate uh, the likelihood of uh, him agreeing to us. Also, if we offer him more than one gold a day, it increases our likelihood as well. So uh, you would you, you you don't have a penalty to charisma though, right? I have a t I have a straight ten, I believe. Yeah, so, so you're fine. Yeah. So you would roll a straight two d six. Um, and yeah. according to the chart here, uh, you need um, a six to eight will require you to roll again, a nine or higher. Uh, will he'll accept the offer? All right, whatever. I'll roll it. Okay, so I'm gonna roll two d six. Okay. Dangle that coin out in front of Artemidoros, the cleric. You roll a five, and he's like, "Not for that amount of coin, I'm not coming into the dungeon." Into Stonehill, you said. <laughs> Have to pay me quite a bit more, my friend. Well. Saints be willing. <laughs> Ooh. Um, so that's the only taker that that David got, or other people can try and hire. Anyone can try and hire. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There might be a limited amount of people that you know. I'd say there's probably like three. I'll say there's three retainers lying around the local tavern where you can <laughs> try to pick up. Can I ask you a quick question about um, rations? Um, so there's two kinds of rations, iron rations and standard rations, obviously. Mm -hmm. When you click on them, it says that the quantity is seven for what you buy. Mm -hmm. Is that seven days or is that seven meals or what's seven the days. deal with that? Seven days. You know, your typical rations, you mark one off a day whenever you rest. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, it's past time though. So, uh, we're going to have to yeah. call, call a halt here. Okay. Um, cool. so I guess we'll have to finish stuff up off, off session, I guess. I, I think I'm done, John, if you want to check my equipment. Uh, yeah, I'll check it out. I'll that is only, it. that is only going to leave me like basically, um, two gold. For your left. armor and, um, weapons, you need to, I believe, actually click the little shirt icon next to them, um, to actually equip them and cause their... Well, for armors, especially to actually have it apply to your AC, uh, just to be aware. Um, but this will be the only campaign that is up on Foundry now. So um, at any time, you guys can just go ahead and log in and putz around and take a look around. 
Um, just cool. make sure that if you're buying anything that you, you know, keep tabs of it and adjust your gold pieces accordingly. Um, what the f fuck? My Why armor class my... went down to negative two. Yeah, mine's at negative one and I'm wearing leather armor. I'm wearing a hat. Well, did you change it in... Let's see. Uh, inventory. I mean, I'm that not complaining. Weird. Huh. Well, I think that's something worth worrying about later. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I do need to. Uh, sorry. I need to go. I got to work quite yeah. early tomorrow. Yeah. Not a problem. So, I will John, this was it. very cool. Yep. Looking forward to it, John. Yep. Should this be, is be cool. Uh, yeah, man. Yeah, I guess we'll, we'll figure out the retainer thing later. I failed, so you'll have to roll for a retainer. Yeah, we'll figure it out off stream. Cool. All right. Okay. Cool. No worries. All right, guys. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, guys. Yep. I'll talk to you off. Pleasure as always. Bye.